All right, folks. So thanks for being here for class today. Um, looks like we got a full house again. Um, I'm going to be recording as usual. So, you know, I do, I do believe I have everybody on the calls uh, signed agreements. So if you don't have those, you know, make sure you give them to me as soon as you can. Um, I'll work a little later into um, anybody who needs assistance with the actual discussion board. So all of the students enrolled in the class should have gotten an invitation to join uh, the NCCU Moodle account. That's their learning management system. It's basically their version of Blackboard. And um, I know a couple of you had some questions about how to translate the language, and I could put together a small, like a really quick guide to walk you through that. Um, our first discussion date won't be until the week of October 5th. And remember, the way these are working is we're recording our videos in advance of their semester. So like the first discussion date will actually be about the interactivity stuff from a few weeks ago. And if you look at the syllabus, it will tell you, here's the topic, here's the recording date, and here's the discussion date. So you just want to keep that in mind. Uh, as a reminder, the videos are going to be available uh, um, on that Moodle page. And you should, everybody in the chat should also have access to the slides. And then I've also been putting the videos on YouTube but it, through our channel. So you should have access to all of those things. Okay. Um, but let's go ahead and start the show. Um, we've got the recorders going, so we're fine there. Um, and I'm just going to go and jump right in so we can take advantage of our time. So remember last week, we talked a whole lot about interactivity and sort of what does it mean to change what you're seeing on screen. And it's something that sounds really basic, but in many ways, it is the fundamental way in which we understand gaming and VR and any kind of technology where your role as the user changes quite a bit because you get to influence what happens, right? Um, I think I asked last week if anybody's watching the high score documentaries on Netflix. I don't know if anybody here is, um, but they talk a bit about like what it means to be interactive, what it means to change things. In fact, there's a whole episode uh, where they talk about this game called Night Trap, which is a pretty infamous uh, interactive movie from the 90s. And you know, if, if you're not watching that, you might, after having some of these conversations with us, you might enjoy hopping over there and checking out that documentary. I think it's six parts, and it's it's not too bad. Uh, they even cover cover some scholarly work. Well, today we're going to talk a bit more about what it means to be in the experience itself, and, and sort of the science behind how we understand. I'm sure many of you on the call have heard words like immersion, presence, um, narrative engagement. We toss these words around a lot, and they don't often mean the same thing from person to person. And, and one of the things that we try to do when we're doing social science and we're doing technology research is define what those things mean at a more objective level. Because if we're gonna design technologies to make those things happen, we have to have kind of a shared understanding of what that stuff is in the first place. And that's more or less what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna start with presence, because I think that's the one that many of us have probably heard the most about. And it's gonna lead us into some of the things that are similar to presence, but might actually be different things. Um, I've got everybody's notes kind of pulled up on, on my computer so that I can refer back to them as we go. Um, and then again, like last week, remember the main purpose of the prime the pump questions is to get you ready to be engaged in the class. Um, they're not graded per se, although I do want to make sure I'm seeing engagement with the material. So demonstrate that you read something and connect it back, right? And you want to uh, find ways to work those into the conversation if you can. And just to remind everybody, those are due you know, Friday night because Saturday morning I read them to get ready for class today. So that's why I have to have them do you know, a couple hours in advance, okay? Well, let's dive right in. You should all, um, let me share my screen so everybody there can see what I'm doing. Okay, um, give me one second to, to handle that. Well, I say that and now it is giving me some fits here. So, okay, what's going on? Sounds like typical technology. Yeah, it's the balance of trying to get the recordings to work and then also get the, the uh, bit itself to work. One second here, folks. Um, you all should have access to the PowerPoint slide um, if you want to bring it up through Teams as well. Um, that'll work just as well. 
But while you're doing that, I am going to pull up my screen share. Um, this is really frustrating. Okay, let me cut that out of here real quick. There we go. It was just uh, blanking out my. Uh, uh, it was blanking out my bits. Okay, so everybody should be on screen now. We've got some video. We've got some slides. I do have to leave them, unfortunately, in the uh, PowerPoint format in order to get all of the information that we need for our videos. All right. And let me set up in the corner a, uh, a chat feature so that we can have that going at the same time. All right, fantastic. Um, I'm not recording this through Zoom. I'm recording this through OBS instead. You should all be able to see my uh, my screen now. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yep. All right, good. So let's talk about presence a little bit. Okay. Oh, oh just had folks joining us. All right, so actually, before I go any further, what have you heard about the word presence before? I, I suspect that one's come up in the past makes you feel like you're there a sense of uh, it's hard to describe it without using the word presence sure uh, but you, you said sense of being there and what where when we say there what do we mean inside like, of the virtual space or whatever space that is being used it could be a book it could be a tv show whatever. yeah like we know you're sitting here right in a chair or something like this but perceptually you're not perceptually you're you're there. You're somewhere else, even though physically you're not somewhere else. And yeah, that, that, that's not a bad definition. And frankly, when we talk about the research, that is kind of how they design it. Um, maybe a more precise way of putting it is the perceptual illusion of non-mediation. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, what's happening on the screen here? You've got people at a conference call, like in an office, right? And half the folks are sitting around a physical table and they're talking to each other. And the folks on the other side of the table are probably somewhere else, right? And in fact, if you were to go to where they're at, they would be the ones sitting around the table, right? And then they would see people on screen. So when we say non-mediation, we're often referring to face-to-face -face interactions, right? We're referring to... You know, we could argue that when we're sitting face to face with each other, when we're sitting in the same environment, we are not mediated. It's live, so to speak. An in-person class is not mediated, right? Um, so what does it mean to say the perceptual illusion of non-mediation? Um, well, you know, of course, that it's mediated. That's how these things work, right? Right. But while you're engaging with the technology, you're not really concerned about the mediation. As Alex said, you're there. You know, even though you're definitely not, as far as you're concerned perceptually, you're reacting to the on-screen environment just like it were your environment. Does that make sense? That's the general idea. Um, it's a perceptual illusion because, of course, we you know you're not there, okay? Um, and what's really critical about this is this notion of a perception. So if we're thinking about, like, Ready Player One's probably a really good pop culture example of this, right? Where, you know, you're looking at the character on screen and they're engaging with the media. What's the medium in this case? What on screen is the medium? Uh, the headset. The headset. What else, folks? Help them out. The, glo the gloves, the haptic technology, right? Uh, anything else? If you can see real closely, the treadmill he's on. Yeah. 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 So you got the treadmill, you've got the gloves, you've got the headset. I think he's got something around his neck as well. There's like another, yeah. yeah, another sensory piece. So when he's engaging, you know, cyberspace, when he's engaging, I actually forget the name of the space they call it in Ready Player One right now. Um, but when he's engaging the digital world, what is he really engaging with? When he reaches out and grabs something, what's he actually engaging with? 
physically aired. Well, and, and of course, uh, in this case, it's just a, a glove, right? He's squeezing a glove, right? Um, and yeah, other parts of the book, he has a full suit on. If you remember this part of the book or movie, he's not at his, he's not in his house. He is, uh, I think in this one, he may be in the van. I actually can't quite tell, but at different points in the movie he and in the book, in... he has various technologies. It doesn't change the example. The point is, you're not really engaging with the stuff on screen or in your glasses, He's literally squeezing his gloves, right? And he squeezed the gloves, but he's squeezing them as if they weren't there. Because what is, in his mind, what is he grabbing? The object in the virtual space. Yeah, some object online, right? Um, so it's engaging with this physical, tangible medium that has almost nothing to do with what's in your mind, but engaging it in a way that it's not actually there as if it were invisible, or as if it were something other than the medium itself. Again, for many folks on the call today, this doesn't sound all that revolutionary, but remember, we're not talking about the technologies. We're talking about the psychology behind them, right? And what it means to, you know, basically trick somebody to be somewhere else at various levels. And in fact, many of you have probably had experiences that weren't that great because you weren't able to have this illusion of non-mediation right when sam talked about the uh, sam miller talked about the wee bowling last week i was like yeah but you know really if you just sit on your couch and flick your wrist you can bowl a 300 game right you're no longer bowling at that point are you you're just playing a bowling video game and you figured out a trick with the controller to perform really really well it's not a trick that oh my gosh i'm bowling right now right and we can talk about some of these things as we sort of go through the uh you know, as, as we go through our day, okay? Um, presence in a way is illogical. It doesn't really make any rational sense. And then of course, how many of you have like, VR looks funny when you're not the one wearing the equipment, right? You watch somebody in a living I mean, room. Go ahead, Jared. True. I mean, true. I typically just ignore it though, because it's, it's uh, and fun entertainment for others. Oh yeah, definitely. But like, you but know, it's also fun for you. Sure. But like it, it, it doesn't look rational. The person's standing in a room and they're grabbing stuff and ducking at stuff and waving around and, and running around. And to any onlooker, it looks really strange because, of course, we don't have their perceptual information. They're engaging an environment in a fundamentally different way than we're engaging the environment because to us, we only see the pieces. And of course, to them... They're behaving as if the medium is invisible, if it's not there, right? Um, it's illogical. We know it's illogical, right? We, we know this. It's not like when you put on a headset, you literally forget what reality is, right? We, we, we are aware of what we're doing. In fact, we do it voluntarily. Part of the experience is to go somewhere else for a while. It's involuntary in the sense of we often don't control it. It's not like you put the headset on and decide to be present. You can certainly try to decide not to be present. But for the most part, this is how the human perceptual system works. And many people argue it comes from our basic evolution. We don't have any part of our brain that distinguishes digital experiences from physical experiences. Because there's no reason for it. It's the reason that stories work really well. It's the reason that films work really well, right? If our brains kept reminding us that it's all fake, and we talked about this a little bit last time, none of this stuff would work, right? It's sort of like if it looks like a duck and it acts like a duck, we just go ahead and assume it's a duck and tell otherwise, right? Now, of course, things can happen in the medium that remind you that it's not very good, right? We can, well, and we're going to talk about that as we go. One thing that's really important about presence, and this is the one that I think often gets misunderstood in industry. It's not a property of the medium. The medium is not what has presence. The person is present. So we're gonna spend some time today distinguishing between immersion and presence, okay? Um, how would you distinguish between the two? Immersion and presence. I'm just curious, just based on what language you've heard before. Immersion is the game's ability, 
that's like from the gaming end, whereas the presence is like from the human end. What is it about a technology that makes it immersive? Because we can definitely call something an immersive technology. That would not be an inappropriate language. Mm. Riley's not wrong, by the way. He's dead on. But let's go a little further. Like, what makes something an immersive technology? Well, like comparing how immersive a monitor is to how immersive an HMD is. One of them is going to be a lot better just because it makes you see instead of just this flat panel, you see, you can look around and you see all around you. So, so let's put that in terms that are reproducible because what we want to avoid is the danger of defining technologies as immersive and not specifying the underlying principle. So a big problem in tech development and gaming and VR industries is we spend a lot of time describing the stuff in front of us, but we don't think about its underlying conceptual difference. Like what makes HMD more immersive than flat? You're not wrong, of course, but what is it underlying it that makes it more immersive? What is it doing differently? So you said you can look around. More realistic, more senses maybe? More senses, that part. Right? That's the key. Immersive technologies capture more of a person's sensory organs. And we're going to come and hit that a little later in the discussion. But that part's critical because that's how humans understand reality. And so the more you can take those senses and intercept them and give them something else, the more immersive you can be. In fact, what are some of the senses that we don't currently see in VR? Smell. Smell is the big one, right? We haven't quite got there. There's some experimentation going on. There's been patents for 20 years, but we've not really seen a system for smell. And there are some reasons for that. Ta and of course, taste and smell are highly linked, right? One problem with those two is they tend to be very, they, they tend to exist as consumables right now. You would have to have like devices or fluids or some kind of consumable product. Whereas the other senses don't require consumables. So they're easier to make it scale. Does that make sense? Like you'd have to have like taste and smell cartridges and eh, it's going to get expensive really fast. Um, but there's some experiments with this, right? So going with this track, if we accept presence as a person side variable and not a property of the medium. Now, of course, things in the medium can influence, you know, how present you feel or not. I don't think anybody would would contest that notion. Okay, and we're going to talk about some of those right now. I've got a little comment. Sure. Um, it's talking about all this presence and stuff, it's also reminds me of like that's kind of the goal in regards to like let's say Disney World or Land, like in regards to the Star Wars Land. Mm -hmm. Like the whole idea is to make you feel like you are in the Star Wars universe with like their shops or their attractions and things. Like that's what a lot of the Disney rides seem to be as well. That they try to like immerse you. Um, in senses like the ride, the soaring ride, which is like a flying simulated ride, they use senses, uh, smells. To make yep. feel like you're going to There's smells that come through. There's different feelings of haptics. Wind is a big one, right? Um, and, and of course, the notion of like uh, a sensory video has been around for a long time. I mean, going back to I think even the 60s, there were theaters where they would like puff air at you during action moments in a horror movie or like drip water from the ceiling. I cannot remember the director's name right now, but he was very famous for these things. He also tried to do 3D movies in the 50s. Um, the technology has been stereoscop stereoscopic technology has been around for a very long time. You can go to an antique store in Lubbock and buy stereoscopes from 1900 where they show you I like just a realize what picture that is. Yeah, that's from the meetup. <laughs> so with presence, it is a person side variable, but there are things within the system that can help encourage presence. But it is really important that we understand presence as a psychological variable because it starts helping us better understand why some people get it and some people don't, even if they're using the same exact technology, right? So one of these would be social richness. This would just be environments that encourage you to have social interactions. So this was a clip from uh, one, I, I think, Jared, what, what uh, event was this? This was the... Uh... Virtual Org Fair, I believe. Yeah, this is the Virtual Org Fair for Tech VR, and a couple other folks on the call joined us on that one. And this is actually Jared and I sitting in VR chat 
Uh, um, you know, can you guess who's who? I'm just curious. You're Al. I'm Al. <laughs> yep. Although I dumped that suit for a Gundam uh, RX-78 <laughs> recently. so Although it's too I'm, small. Uh, I'm uh, looking for another model. Uh, <laughs> I just look into seeing how to fix that one. It's a little... And walk me through here, like, what are some of the things that make this environment socially or rich? So, like, the care you can have nonverbal, so you can move your arms and hands, and you can point at people and talk to them. Jared, if I'm not mistaken, if you're using the microphone, your your avatar's mouth will move, it'll open up and close. If it's set up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can set it up that way. It's not perfect, but it includes, you know... Uh, cro uh, proxemics matters. The fact that I'm sitting close to him is a communication in itself, as opposed to me sitting like across the room. In fact, I remember Jared talking like when he first joined the room, like nobody was anywhere near him, and it's like I don't feel like anyone's talking to me because you're all like way across the room, right? Social richness cues help people feel a sense of presence because social richness cues help guide our communications with each other. Right? And we go, oh, yeah, I feel comfortable talking in this environment because the environment's allowing me to do some of these things. Okay. Not to mention doodling. Yeah, there's the doodle. And, of course, those are things that you can't do in real life. So, so one of the fallacies that we run into with presence research is that it's all about replicating reality. But there are people who are saying, well, why replicate the flaws of our physical environments when we can go further? We can do stuff like I can't just walk into a classroom and just, you know, write in the air. They actually do make light pins, but they're very expensive, right? I can do things in this environment that I couldn't do in a face to face environment. So we can even talk about are there cues that exist above and beyond what we're used to, right? Another... I just think I might be able to throw Go ahead. a question sure. here for one of them. So why do people seem more prone to tell people what is troubling them in immersive technologies, like specifically VR? Especially I've had people dump their life stories to me while in VR. Anonymity. Part of it may be anonymity and part of it might be social richness. The, the environment spark a sense of interaction. Um, there's a little bit of, and I wouldn't call it anonymity, I would call it pseudo-anonymity. Pseudo because uh, you do have some cues. They're just not really good indicators of who you are. And we know from actually computer-mediated communication research that the combination of pseudo anonymity and social richness leads people to have more conversations. Jared, in a way, it's, bar it's, it's the bartender effect, right? You go into an environment. The environment seems pretty social. You can sit down. It's acceptable to talk to people. You don't know them that well. It's a different space. And there are cues that say, hey, let's chat, you know? So it's actually an effect we're seeing uh, in, in like social video games. Um, we see players of like World of Warcraft who don't actually play the game. They just go to the cities and talk to people and hang out. There's actually taverns in Azeroth that people go to and have a beer and talk. And then they don't actually really advance the game at any point, right? And, and that's a legitimate form of play, right? And I think all these social richness cues play, play a role. And that's where you're seeing like uh, VR chat, hubs. You're seeing a lot of focus right now on social VR. I think that's going to be the next barrier for people's abilities to see the value of the technology. And once they realize that it's no longer an isolating experience, it's going to play a big role moving forward. You know. Yeah, it's, it's a great question though. But you do see some research on this. And Jared, I suspect that that research is going to be very hot in the coming years because social VR is still kind of in its infancy. Um, so that's a good thing to think about researching. I don't think we have a great handle on that one yet because I don't think we're ready for what social VR is going to be. You know, imagine Facebook, but you're literally walking around the same spot. You know, and all the cues that are going to be in that environment that say, hey, let's chat or let's fight or let's do any of the other things people do when they get together. But as Alex said, when they get together in a pseudo anonymous way with consequences that aren't the same, right? I can fight somebody in VR and not get hurt. So there'll be something to talk about. I um, can fight someone in VR I'm... and be successful. Right, right. I can win this but fight. I might, but I might add to that. Uh huh. Another thing, like with VR chat, making your own custom world and inviting people to it, you really you can make you can make your own room, you can mm -hmm. make your house, you can make your dream room. And you can show people that. And it really just brings forward a lot of new things with it. Sure. And you can do it at scale, right? So now it's not tied to, you got to come to my place. It's, I'll bring my place to you. 
it's great. Yeah, I think I think it's definitely something we can think about. Um, I, it's a great point. It's a really good point. Another thing about the mechanisms that drive this is social realism. Um, you know what's on screen? Football stadium. Yeah, even though like it's not a very good version of it, it's missing half the walls. There's a whole campus around it that's not there. It's kind of blocky and a little weird looking. I'm being is critical. This is a Minecraft. Yes. Well, that's what I'm it's saying. A like, work to make that. That's the point I'm trying to make, though, is we would never say that because we recognize that it's Minecraft. And that was, you're right, a ridiculous amount of work to build this thing, right? We would never go, oh, God, that's not a photo of the stadium. What a pile of junk. If anything, it's like, wow, anybody who's ever stepped foot in a, in a digital environment, and especially Minecraft, would not rip this apart. They'd be like, that's kind of cool. Throw shaders on it. it would even better. Shaders <laughs> makes it so good. I can give you shaders yeah. right now to add. Well, and, you know, not to mention, is that how the surrounding area of the football stadium looks? Like, not at all. <laughs> you know, it's, it's close not. enough. You know, that's it's the honestly idea. Honestly, not that far off. In VR and in digital spaces, we, we don't always need all of the cues for something to be realistic. And it's, it's something called a minimal cues hypothesis that oftentimes we only need enough for us to go, okay, I buy this, I get it, I move on, right? And that becomes kind of interesting when you think about presence as a psychological variable. You don't always need 100% full bore everything every time. Um, isn't that because like our brain fills in the gaps and throws what isn't there? Anymore? More or less. Yeah, it's a combination that we fill in the rest. And even when we're walking around campus, we don't take in everything. A lot of the stuff I ignore because it's not important to what I'm doing. You know, if I'm walking from my office to the library, the stuff in the middle is not that relevant. Oh, no, a tree's out of place. What will we ever do? Right. I guess there's this is another place I can throw another question. I mm -hmm. have uh, what causes like phantom ch uh, touch? And is there a way more people can access that sensation of touch through virtual reality? You're talking about the idea of uh, feeling haptics when there aren't any haptics. Yeah, because I've experienced it's very it. interesting. It's cool. Yeah. Well, it is very cool. It goes back to this conversation, right? I mean, if you're having an illusion of non-mediation, your mind's not separating things out, right? So if someone grabs your character's arm and you're engaging in that process, it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination that you would feel that too. Has anybody ever used a flight simulator on a stationary computer and felt a sense of motion? Yes. Yeah, it, it happens quite a bit, actually. Um, it happens in driving simulators. If you get some of like the, the wraparound screens and you can feel a sense of like people get car sick in a driving simulator when they didn't actually move at all, you know, um, it's all connected it on me and various sims and it, it helped, works pretty well. It, it's, it's surprisingly not that surprising that these things happen because again, if the illusion of non-mediation, our minds filling in those gaps, and we're making sense of the experience. And sometimes we're trying to reconcile what we're seeing, not the other way around. That's what makes it illogical. Rather than rather than reconciling physically what we're doing, we're reconciling sensory what we're doing. And at a very high level of abstraction, you could argue that our experiences are sensory more than anything else. Anybody wearing glasses on the call knows what I'm talking about. We're not seeing the real world. Right, we're seeing a refracted version of that to kick into the back of our eyeballs to correct the vision, and sometimes our vision's actually better than average. You know, I think I see twenty ten with my glasses on. You know, so we can, and there's all sorts of discussions around what is it you're actually consuming, and of course, like for me, I didn't wear glasses until I was much older. Um, I just thought things were blurry because I didn't have any point of comparison to tell me otherwise. Right, That's like, so what's that, right? That's so sad. It kind of yeah. is. You'll love this. I played football in high school and didn't wear glasses. Like, literally couldn't see the scoreboard from the field. And I just, like, figured, you know, we'll hike the ball. I don't know. Just don't wait that long. <laughs> like, I guess you get 24 seconds. I got no idea. I can't. I literally, my uncorrected vision is 2,600. Yeah. So it's pretty bad. Like, it was not till I got older that I even realized I had a problem because... I sat in the front and passed my classes and 
didn't seem to walk into things a lot, so no one thought there was a problem, right? Oh my God. You know, it can happen. Uh, perceptual realism can happen. It's very similar to social realism, but the idea here can be even if things aren't real, but they're plausible, this environment seems real because we can engage what it would be like to be wearing gloves and walking on dirt and seeing stones in front of us and maybe having a spaceship. Of course, those things aren't real, but we can put ourselves in that environment. We're like, okay, yeah, I get this. I can figure out what those sensations feel like. So think about how much VR and gaming takes place in environments that have no real world analogy. In fact, a great deal of them take place in environments that do not have a real world analogy. And yet we can experience those environments as if they were real, i.e. we can feel presence within those environments. Okay. Um, No, go ahead. Uh, Like with Half-Life Alex, it's, you know, there's not a single real place in that, but after you've played through that and you get to see a lot of it, you really feel connected with the world after you've played through and saved all these people and helped out with things. It's, it's, it's weird because it's not real and there's no place like it, but it's a place that you're familiar with. Right, right. Yeah, you have familiarity with something that doesn't exist. And uh, actually, we'll talk about that here in a little bit with the sense of place work. And that's actually uh, Phil's research is on this notion of being familiar with things. Um, Another one is thinking about different forms of what we might call transportation. Um, And these words admittedly get a bit fuzzy even in the literature. There's a lot of fights within presence research on what all of these different terms mean. Um, you know, the article you read was from 1997. The reason I have you read that article is because I think it's really interesting how prophetic it was, that it actually laid the course for a lot of the experiences that we have today. And it explains most of them with pretty good fidelity. Like it's a pretty good explanation. Uh, but now of course that we have almost 30 years of scholarship, we're starting to revisit some of Lombard and Ditton's ideas. And in fact, for, for folks on the call who were doing research in this space, those are the things that we're working with right now. Uh, Matthew Lombard is the president of the International Society for Presence Research. And so very much still seeing lots of uh, engagement with those principles and concepts. Um, one way to think about presence is, well, I'm going to take you and transport you there. It's a metaphor. So I'm, I'm using the word to define itself because it's very much meant to be a metaphor. So like right now, I am standing in Pallet Town or wherever this is in, in Pokemon. Those are my hands. That's my Pokeball. And I guess I'm going to fight the person in front of me. I don't know exactly. Let's just go with that. But I'm standing right there. Right? You are here. Rather, you are there. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to the perceptual realism for a second? Sure. Um, so I have a question, I guess. So like um, when, a, when a game gives you this sense of like perceptual realism, um, is it more likely to like give you like lingering effects after you leave the game? And I ask this because uh, I played a Firewatch like a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And when I would leave the game, even after like, like after playing for a few hours, in the real world, I would feel paranoid. Why don't you explain Firewatch to folks on the call just in brief so they understand what you're talking about? So Firewatch is like a first-person uh, game where you play a man who goes and lives in a Firewatch tower for a summer in a national park. And uh, your only communication in that game is like with a woman with a walkie-talkie and she tells you to like, go tell people in the national park to stop shooting fireworks and stuff. And then like a, a mystery kind of unfolds in it. And it, it's not insanely creepy, but it does get a little like creepy. So is it any different than a movie? No. Yeah. It's, this is how media work, right? We, we, we do take the experiences outside, right? Um, maybe the question really is, is it more intense when you feel presence? And the answer is probably yes, because you literally went somewhere. Like in your mind, you went somewhere and now you're back. And that's sort of what makes this stuff interesting, right? For better or for worse, right? We're, we're, We're literally 
having real experiences. And so what's likely happening in that situation is that that experience was at the, at the, at some level, like pretty much more or less internalized. And when you immediately leave it and shift, you know, that break doesn't happen right away. It's not that you actually thought, you know, you needed to protect this place from fire, right? But you have this experience, you're coming back out of it, you're walking around again. It's not too surprising that there would be effects that would linger for a while. Um, we see this with, 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 with low presence media, right? Where we, we carry the experiences around with us. That's why I think it's so important to study the, the psychology of it and not the technologies. Because the psychologies often tend to transcend the technologies. Or rather the technologies exist at a matter of scale, but the psychologies exist for all of them. But yeah, that, that wouldn't surprise me at all that if you combine some of these different effects, you don't just easily withdraw from it because it's it's part of your actual experience, right? Uh, you lagged out. We couldn't hear you for the last little bit. The answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So one idea is you were there, right? Simple as that. You're there. You're in the experience. That's how this thing works, right? Uh, one idea is that it is here. So what's happening on my screen right now? Uh, delicious. It's delicious. I was playing Pokemon, Pokemon Go. Go. And Magikarp is in the frying pan. <laughs> yep. You're frying a fish. Now, of course, you're not really frying a fish, right? But AR is a great example of it is here. It's it's the perfect example of it is here, right? Um, that's sort of the, the fundamental premise of AR technologies, which I think folks often tend to confuse them, um, AR and VR, because they get kind of thrown around in the same pot. But for sure, AR is about bringing things to you. And putting them in your environment. And of course, the fun part of Pokemon was just this. Like, getting the Pokemon to be, like, in the exact, like, like overlay with your reality. And then you could, I could fry a Pokemon or I could hold a Pokemon or whatever it was, right? Um, and that's what we're going to see. And in some ways, this might help us psychologically distinguish the two states. Because in some ways, they're not that related to each other. Because they deal with very different levels of technology, very different types of sensory immersion. One person asked in the questions, let me pull it up here. It was a comparison between the two, and I'm just trying to find it in my question list. If it was yours, feel free to ask it now. Uh, basically, somebody had asked if immersion would be higher if you had VR versus AR. Um, and of course, if we're thinking about immersion in the way that I'm thinking about it, it means something a little different, right? Um, from a sensory perspective, I don't know if they necessarily distinguish from each other because you could probably have AR with high levels of sensory immersion. Like if we could smell a fish cooking right now, like that'd be pretty wild. Like you put a fish in a pan and then you can smell it cooking, right? Uh, but you can do the same thing in VR. In terms of presence, I don't necessarily know if it would be higher or lower, right? Um, now, now, one idea is that AR, almost by definition, doesn't really allow for this. Because what's the premise of AR, of augmented reality? There's augmented Bring it to reality. you. Currently. Bring it to you. So the idea is I'll put you there. That wouldn't make any sense, right? The whole point of AR is to bring things to you and put them in your space. And the point of VR is mostly to put things in other, to put you in other spaces. This is an area that I actually think could use a lot more research and writing. We know how the technologies work. And oftentimes in all of these discussions, you have to remember the technologies aren't the hard part. Oftentimes the tech is pretty easy to develop. Our understanding of the tech is the part that oftentimes comes much, much later because we just kind of fumble around with it. Not to mention from like a diffusion of innovation perspective, most tech is only accessible to the developers in the beginning. 
So there's a sense that they don't quite know how the average person is going to consume these things. Not to mention there's a bit of elitism in, in tech and VR and gaming worlds where we, we tend to define things as like you can have it, but you can't have it because you're a noob. And that's fine, but if you're talking about releasing technologies to the world, at some point, everyone has to be able to use them, right? And um, that's something that we often see a clash. Um, going back to that high score show, um, one of the things I thought was particularly interesting is they were interviewing the developers of, um, um, of Mortal Kombat, and they could not figure out why folks are so upset about this game. Because for them, they're just making an homage to kung fu movies. And it was all kind of satirical and it was all kind of a joke. And we've had these Kung Fu movies for like 30 years. So why would the game be any worse? And of course, they didn't realize that people would interpret it very, very, very differently. Now it's a murder simulator, right? Yeah. I don't know if this happens every time Mortal Kombat comes out, um, but that that was revisited when the last one came out. And I remember because uh, people were saying it was almost like, too realistic mm -hmm. that 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 value of it like just being campy and like making fun of old movies is almost like missed with how realistic and, and gruesome the murders are becoming which is the irony because what's more realistic than a video game the actual movie where they kill people <laughs> right exactly right this has always been an irony it's important out like he'll point to the source material and coach you could probably help here like the source material was has anybody ever seen the movie ricky o it is, go watch it, it's on, it's on YouTube. It's sort of the king of campy kung fu. At one point, a guy gets choked with his own bowels. Oh, disgusting. Yeah. It's campy kung fu. Way more realistic than a video. Even the video game hasn't done that yet, right? Right. But context matters, and games are typically seen to be for children. So it gets lost, right? Um, but yeah, you're probably right. And we haven't seen much of it in VR yet in Hat. In part because we haven't seen many of the developments yet, but it's coming. It's coming. There's, uh, in, I know I'm Blade and Sorcery, there, it's there a little bit, mm -hmm. and also there's Gorn, but, like, in Blade and Sorcery, you can, like, lop people's limbs off. It's just a matter of time before we see those, and it's not an automatic dismissal of the arguments. They're important discussions to have, but... It's just a matter of time. Right now, it seems more than anything else, the developers themselves have just been constrained. Uh, constrained themselves. They're like, um, we're not going to make that one yet. you know. But eventually, somebody is going to make it. Right? They're going to make what you're talking about, and it's going to be really high res, and then we're going to see where these things go, right? Well, that could be essentially like uh, GTA, right? Like, Possibly. Where else could they go? Is VR is probably next. And it ends up being the killer app. Person and you just want to run around and like murder people. It's pretty brutal. Yep, that, that will probably be the next step, you know, in fantasy work. And this will be the, the discussion we'll have about presence. Doesn't matter, right? Um, another part of presence of transportation is putting folks in the same space. We are there together. Right? This is this is an example of Pokemon skins in VR chat, right? Where we are hanging out. And we're in a similar, we're in a shared space with each other, right? Um, this is the one that I was talking about a moment ago. What is really exciting, I think, for me in the, air, the work that I do is sensory immersion. And, and if there's nothing else you take away from today, it's distinguishing immersion from presence. Um, immersion is a feature of the technology. It's the technology's ability to override and saturate your senses. And I think Alex said it at the very beginning of the call. All technologies probably have some form of immersion. It's just a matter of scale, right? It's a matter of scale. Um, it's not overly critical you know every single one of these points. Uh, this is from a, a, a guy named Frank Bioka who wrote a, a uh, article called The Cyborg's Dilemma. And I think the VR folks on the call would really appreciate that that reading. It's a bit philosophical, but his argument... Has anybody heard the cyborg's dilemma before? It's that technologies, by definition, are artificial. All technologies are artificial. Artificial meaning what? Synthetic. Synthetic, yeah. they're not part of us. If we are natural... If we're a product of 
whatever got us here to begin with, right? Anything that we use that's not part of us is synthetic. It's artificial. It's a technology, right? Um, as we use technologies in ways that are increasingly normal or increasingly normalized, they seem to become more natural. Which creates a cyborg. And the dilemma is that our world is made up of artificial tools that we've integrated that we've integrated into our operations at such a precise level that you really can't separate the person from the technology. And I'll give one really good example. Okay. What is this? It's a watch. It's a smartwatch. It's a watch. What's its primary function? Tell time. Okay. Why? So you can know what time it is. And why do we need to know that? So you can get to places that you need to go on time. So you, you see the tautology. We need to know time because time is important. But it's, it's not really a property of anything, right? Like uh, our ancestors didn't tell time, right? Uh, it wasn't important to them. Sundials. Well, I'm talking, about going back I'm talking about going back further than that. Like to the very beginnings. Uh, why did we walk around during the daytime and sleep at night? Because there were less... We well, could yeah, we could see and there were less dangerous predators out yeah. during the day. Yeah. I mean, it was functional. It was just like, my organs only work when there's light for my eyes to receive. Other animals don't have this problem, right? They do the opposite. Um, the natural way to do things would be to wake up when you're hungry, go find something to eat, and then go back to bed. And that's it. That That's natural. Survive. And then make more of you. Right? That's basically all we need to do. Of course, we noticed patterns, didn't we? We noticed there was the times at which survival was easy and times when survival was hard. Times, right? So we organized those things. What happened when we domesticated fire? How did it change our relationship with our environment? You, know, I had a nice see more. you can see more. You can keep yourself warm. You can start exploring places that were dangerous before. At some point, you figured out that fire will chase things away too. But it changed who we were. We could do different things now. And the argument, taking it all the way to like wearing a wristwatch or wearing a VR helmet, is that there are technologies we do today that we use today that to us are, we even call them natural. They're just normal. They're just part of who we are. They didn't exist 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Right? So the cyborg's dilemma is that as we get used to these things and work them into our biological systems, we become less natural or more cyborgic. Um, in my 2130 class, I spend a lot of time talking about this from our media as tools discussion. And Javier and I freak and a couple other folks are going to recognize this conversation. They've already had it before. Riley, I think, is having it right now, right? Um, and it sounds like just a lofty philosophical exercise, but it really gets at the heart of presence. Because I'm going to bet if you took a Super Nintendo and you managed to bring back, bring that to 1600 and you had the ability to run it, let's just say, hypothetically, you could have somebody give a controller and they could see the screen and it would power itself. How would they respond to that image on screen? They would collapse. It'd be so far outside comprehension. They'd we look back on it. Go ahead. They would burn the witch. <laughs> they might burn the witch for bringing it, right? We have similar reactions to technologies today, right? Like, you know, so it's it's all relative. Um, it's all about where we've integrated the things into our systems. There's almost always somewhere else to go. There's almost always something considered natural. And, and that's how you can kind of follow the progression curve. I mean, even HMDs have been around for quite a long time. 
Um, but we're already seeing efforts to get away from body attachments. Because what's the problem with having to wear a bodysuit or gloves? Wait. Sure, wait. It's still a medium, isn't it? Yeah. It's always going to disrupt presence a little bit because you're going to feel the sensation of the thing that's not part of what's on screen and you have to reconcile that. Like a, a truly immersive experience is just the world around you. And then we get into discussions around that. And so we can think about how we think about the notion of immersion, of sensory immersion. But generally speaking, the more of your senses we can immerse through the technology in a way that feels natural to you, where you're not thinking about mediation, the more likely it is you'll feel presence. Are the haptic gloves better than using Oculus Quest pinch your finger function? Well, functionally, yes, but the pinch your finger function feels a lot more realistic. And as it gets better, it will feel more realistic. Because at the end of the day, and mine are across the room, the, the controllers are weird. That's not how we interact with the world. So there's always a balancing act of how many senses can I put in to where the system still functions. And that's another issue. And then we'll even talk about situations where that gets confused because people often use different objects to refer to the same thing. Uh, for many gamers, for example, we talked about it last week, the controller is natural, even though it's definitely not natural. It's a great example of the cyborg's dilemma. An NES controller is more natural than a haptic system. Even though by definition it cannot be. Okay. But is it more immersive? It's not more immersive. That's the, that's the problem. That's exactly the problem. It should be the case that more immersive means more natural. Right? More immersive means I'm tapping more of the human perceptual system, which is the system that is natural to you. And yet we're seeing time and time again, more immersive technologies being less natural. And it gets at this notion of a disconnection. Okay. So I think I can throw my last question in. in sure. Right uh, with greater presence and immersion, why do virtual atmospheres seem to be more impressive or like, te like in horror games as they're more tense? Can you say that one more time? Uh, with greater presence and immersion, why do virtual atmospheres seem to be more impressive, such as horror games being more tense in VR? What do you all think? Because in VR, you are the only thing in direct control of yourself. When it's a video game that's, let's say it's on your Xbox, your PlayStation, I don't know. Uh, there's a controller and a distance between you and the screen. When the HMD is on your face and you're holding the controllers in your bare hands like that, it's, it's different. You're, uh, you're more involved. And the more involved you are, the more responsible you feel for the character that you're playing as and for yourself as well. And then there's all the stuff like sound and everything. I mean, in some ways, Jared, it, it's the question is a bit of its own answer because the answer for me is yes. <laughs> more immersion leads to more presence, leads to more involvement. Right? So the technologies are engaging these things, then absolutely you're going to be responding to them more strongly. Right? Because there's an illusion of non mediation. Literally, you're not processing this as something separate from you. You're processing this as if it's happening to you. Right? With all I know of... in like, uh, like Skyrim VR, when there's like a pretty view, it's a lot better than like on screen, like playing, you know, just flat Skyrim VR. It's a lot different. Mm -hmm. Sort of. As it should be, right? Because if it or, wasn't, yeah. there wouldn't be a gain in the technologies. Right. Um, that's exactly right. It, you're really tapping at the notion of increased sensory immersion leading to increased presence. In the case of Skyrim VR, it's not a different environment, but it's totally surrounding you. So you are literally taking in more of it, which think about things like peripheral vision. Well, peripheral vision is more or less meaningless on a TV screen. 
because it's not peripheral vision. But we know from our daily experiences that peripheral vision is a really big part of our daily lives. We don't think about it that way, but we don't walk around like this. So if you're just in an environment and you're getting these natural cues that you're used to getting in like real space, suddenly the gap is closed. The expectations close because now I'm getting more information that has a similar fidelity to the world around me that I'm used to. And that's going to explain some of the patterns you're seeing. That immersion, that extra sensory information. So it's really important that we don't think about this stuff as a binary. It's not like, do you have sight or do you not have sight? If you think about it as a continuum, you could argue that the Skyrim VR is saturating your eyes with more information than Skyrim flat. Same with audio. And you can think about all the other senses. And it's not that it's engaging all of them, but it's engaging some of them more deeply, which is going to lead to greater presence, which is probably going to lead to a greater reaction. I feel tense because that thing's happening to me in a presentation that I can make sense of immediately. In some ways, you don't need a mental model for experiences that are tapping into your perceptual system because your mental model for the Skyrim experience is the same mental model you use for reality. And that's kind of where a lot of this research and technology is trying to go, right? Um, does that make sense? Okay. We can think about different things that are in the environment, right? So in this scenario, we've got a situation where there are there are actors in the medium. Anybody played this game before? My sister has. Yeah, Nintendogs. You have animals on screen. You can interact with them and you can feed them and you can raise them, right? Um, and, and they exist as sentient beings, but in that screen, in that world, right? Um, that That's one way to think about presence. But uh, also the story of, uh, uh, in the last class I had with you, on the man who married, like, the video game girl. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sal 9000. Um, I forget the name of the game now. And of course, it wasn't a legal wedding. But uh, he was playing a dating game on his Nintendo DS and developed a persona of this girl in the game who was perfect for him. And he had a wedding ceremony with her. Um, and it's now about 10, 15. It's actually quite an old story now, right? Uh, but it would be a great example. He didn't marry the DS... He married the girl inside the environment through the DS. Mm -hmm. Anybody watch Ar uh, Anybody watch Archer? He has his holographic girlfriend, <laughs> and and he's literally like dating her, like inside the media, right? Um, and of course, this is not becoming so out there anymore. Lots of folks use uh, digital assistants in the office to respond to emails, to answer phone calls where we have these like, you know, basically Jarvis type systems. They're maybe not at that level of, of uh, realism, but they're there. You know, there are these users, with them, there are these users inside the medium that we treat as real, even though they, they're not real in the sense of biological organs that are in, that are in the world, right? It's not that surprising. And then of course we can treat the medium itself as a social actor. Anybody use one of these before? Yeah, uh, Jibo. Um, so Dr. Banks's research is on robotics and how, and she doesn't do robotics development. She doesn't do work looking at um, those type of scenarios. Um, rather, she looks at how people understand the relationship with robots. And she tries to under, unpack and, and, and make sense of all of that. Like, what do we do when we're actually engaging with these machines? Um, because what she's finding in her research, and other folks are finding similar things, we don't immediately discount them. Um, Alex, I saw your hand up. Um, can you describe, like, an interaction with Jibo to us? Uh, this was a while ago. Uh, what was it? 
it was in my living room, I think, and it just kind of looked at me, and so I waved at it. Mm -hmm. I think it said hi. Yeah, it can wave its head back and forth, and it, it has this one eye that will follow you around. Um, and then, of course, the eye can also show, like, icons and emojis and things like that. Um, it can it can speak. And, and do you remember, like, can you characterize its voice in any particular way? Um, I think it was a woman's voice. This was, like, a couple of years or so ago. Most of the ones that we use have a child's voice. And it's very, like, childlike. Like, not, like, eight-year-old, but sort of, like, uh, childish. And I think you can change the settings on them. But um, it's almost like a childish, like like small child, like a small boy, or you can do a small girl, of course. Uh, but it's very. Why would they choose a childlike voice for this thing? Uh, because people are put more at ease when they're talking to something that sounds like a child. Yeah, it's like a person to like a fully grown adult. Like, it, mm -hmm. right. and it might be more innocent. Um, Jibo is relatively small. He's only about a foot and a half tall. Um, and, and, and he can dance and move. So both his head and his body, his torso can move independently of each other. He himself cannot move from any one location. Um, so Dr. Banks has one in our office still. Um, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's kind of inquisitive. It's kind of childlike. Another reason for that metaphor is Jibo is meant to learn from its environment. And so if you spend more time with Jibo, Jibo gets to know you. Um, Jibo can remember faces. So like if Riley were to go to Dr. Banks' office, and talk to Jibo for like a half hour, and then leave and come back a week later, Jibo will go, hey, Riley, how are you doing? It's good to see you again. Because it can remember just using its its front-facing camera who you are. Wait, uh, does, she have, does she have that in her office? Yeah. Yeah, we've actually done research with it. Uh, uh, we did some work with Phil where we actually had Jibo play video games with somebody else. Although I guess that was actually a Wizard of Oz study where Jibo didn't actually play. But... Um, yeah, um, that's all our research is varying levels of robot. So we definitely have scenarios where you can feel a sense of like presence with this machine that is not, yes, it's there with you, but you're not talking to it as if it's a machine. You're talking to it as if it's a person. So on, on like what level can... Uh can they like socialize, you know, like, can you have a mild conversation with these things? Well, I mean, I, I guess I would throw it back at you and say it kind of depends on the user, right? I mean, in many ways, it's what user. level are we accepting of, right? Um, that concept varies from person to person in many ways. Um, there's a whole concept called the media equation where we tend to treat technologies as if they were human unless they give us a reason not to. And we're just seeing that with these ones as well. You know, Alex mentioned basic. Um, yeah, it, it depends on what you want out of it, right? I mean, um, I've seen folks have surprisingly deep conversations with Siri before. You know, so a lot of it has to do with how the, how the medium is an actor responds to you. Does it give you cues to help you with that perception of non-mediation? And that's really the key, you know. Um, we won't talk about it much in this class, but it, it goes back to the Turing test you may have heard of before. You know, at the point at which somebody has a conversation and the person speaking back with you, um, you don't really distinguish or care whether it's a real person or it's a, a robotic actor. Because for all intents and purposes, it's satisfying these same basic dimensions of presence and therefore helping you understand it better. Technology like that would be good for like old people when they're like lonely like they just need like a companion. I That's like. one of the main areas it's already used in. Um, so especially in Japan, we're seeing. Uh, so for those folks going on the um, the study abroad trip in the spring to Tokyo, um, we won't go to the you know retirement communities, but we'll go to an innovation museum where they talk about this that they've been rolling out social robotics in retirement centers for exactly what Riley is talking about. People get lonely. They don't have anybody to talk to. Their families won't come visit them. And one of the ways, and we know that loneliness is a predictor of dementia. And so one of the things that we're seeing is robotic therapies where they're giving people these social machines to spend time with. Um, some of them are functional. They remind you to take your medicines and eat and things like that. But what they're actually finding out is people attach themselves socially to these machines. Um, not unlike how a small child would interact with a teddy bear. 
That's so cool. Anyway, it's and I guess the the data to this point is pretty positive. It's like it's working really well. And then folks are like really upset about it because it doesn't sound very human. But then the response is, well, it's solving a real problem. Like you're not just going to drop what you're doing and go fix it. So this is the next best thing we got. And looking at principles of social presence in this case, you're not so much being there because, of course, you are there. But the sense of being in a social interaction, it kind of makes sense that it would work that way. You know, again, the there's no reason not to accept it for what it is, and people live with it and they move on and they're they're doing pretty well actually. So any questions or comments or things that I left out of your conversations about the notion of presence? And again, it, I, I know that it sounds basic, but the point of the course is to try to complicate these things and talk about them a little more. So did I miss anybody's content here before I move on to the next topic? I've got a little something I think. Sure, please. Um, one of my uh, questions was basically um, in regards to video games, does basically the increase in graphics over time maybe decrease sense of presence slash place in past games? For example, like um, there's a the the you know about the uh, super, uh, super Mario 3D All Stars mm -hmm. coming out. One of the games I used to play was the Super Mario Sunshine open world, and that was like my first video game I ever played. Looking back at it, uh, at the images and stuff, uh, the sense of like presence slash place is a little less there, I feel, because just because the graphics nowadays have been improved so much to kind of like increase that. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, would, do you think that graphics has maybe some part to play with regards to sense of place, presence at all? Well, definitely. I mean, it probably goes back to perceptual realism, right? Um, better, higher fidelity graphics are going to make it easier to feel perceptual realism. So it's not so much that the other stuff didn't trigger presence. It probably just triggered it either at lower levels or on different dimensions, right? So like for me, I remember when the Super Nintendo came out and it was revolutionary. Like the idea of 16-bit graphics was mind-blowing. No one had ever seen colors that bright. And really for Super Nintendo, it was the sound. It was really crisp sound. And nobody had ever seen that before. And so at the time, it was remarkably like, like realistic relatively to its predecessors. Like when you gave Mario eight more pixels, it changed Mario entirely. So from like a social realism bit from like a, yeah, it seems great, but it didn't really reach this. And so it's unlikely that we thought it was perceptually all that real. Like yeah. we saw other things going on, but probably not this one. And that wasn't even like in the realm of possibility, like the idea. But then there were some games that were like, I remember playing foot, like I remember when John Madden football came out and like there had never been a football game with 11 people on each side. That was weird. Like, wow, this actually is football and not just like a version of it where there's seven people, right? So on the one hand, it always scales to the times. And so we always have to be careful about looking back and going, wow, those, those Ludites had no idea. But on the other hand, that's why it scales with the times. We always want something better. Going back to the conversation about Mortal Kombat, there was one thing Mortal Kombat did to its character models that was almost unheard of at the time. Anybody know what it was? Was it like 3D modeling? It was rendering of actual actors. Were they... I've seen pictures of, the, of them like in their poses. Yeah. On the internet, it's pretty cool. And that was really wild. Like, that wasn't really a thing we had. I mean, in fact, we played Street Fighter. They're cartoon characters. They're over the top. They're fantasy. And Mortal Kombat modeled real people and real actions. And just, you know, got 16-bit scans of them. And got their animations. And all that added to the controversy, but also to what made the game interesting. Speaking of Mortal Kombat animations, I read an article that people that worked on the development of the last one were suffering from, like, PTSD uh, from researching breaking bones and gruesome stuff like that. Could you share that? I, I haven't read that yet. I'd be curious to know. 
Okay, yeah. I would love to. I would love to read that. Actually, it fits into some research I'm doing right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're doing some work with the CDC on the role that video games play in violence prevention. Oh, okay. And the idea is that people might actually respond in pro-social ways to antisocial content. Um, wow, basically, cool. if you're disgusted, that's actually a good thing. Like, yeah. you're, you're not supposed to celebrate. Well, we can talk about that for sure. Thank you for sending that over. Yeah, uh, sure. Someone else talked about the, oh, I was looking online about uploading my brain to Minecraft. I mean, some people argue it's not all that crazy of an idea. Uh, the limitations of us are like the things that we're in right now. But uh, that all gets into discussions of presence. And then like at the meta, meta level, there are some arguments that would suggest that we never live in the present. And any idea how you could argue that? Like that we never actually live in our realities ever. Like we can't. Like we cannot live synchronously. It's a really meta argument. I'm curious if anybody knows what it is. And it actually does have implications for VR. And feel free, if, if you've been silent today, feel free to hop on the chat if you don't want to talk. But I'm just curious if anybody has this idea that we cannot live in the present. Well, technically, we're all living a couple milliseconds in the, or nanoseconds yeah. in the past. Yeah, explain the logic behind that. Uh, so you got the photons. They bounce off of whatever you're looking at go into your eye and it gets interpreted so and then it's processed by your brain and that happens right think about the implications bit. of that for presence all you're doing is intercepting what the person gets from their reality so when we say immersion what we're literally saying is we're just going to give you stuff not from the physical space you're sitting in but from this artificial experience, why would your brain make sense of it differently? It's sensory information. There's still photons. There's still sound waves, right? They're all the same things intercepted into your eye and then processed by your brain as if they were just part of your reality because they are part of your reality. There are some folks who don't even like to say the word virtual reality because it implies fake. And one argument is that it's not fake. It's a simulation. But it's not, it's no more fake than a haunted house. Or I think someone mentioned Disney parks. It's a bit trippy. It's a bit meta, you know, philosophical. Uh, Alex Sackis on the call, on the lines of the same thing. But Jared, you're right. Like we're always catching up with our reality. We have to process everything and make sense of it. And so sensory immersion is literally about intercepting that process. And making sure you get these things and not those things. And you process it as such right same reason of a, a horror movie is more fun to watch when the lights are out right it's just easier to process the information in front of you and you focus on it a little more okay so presence really is a critical concept it's easy to understand which sometimes makes eyes roll even a little bit but it's not as well understood as you would think how do i make that claim I can point to all the failed technologies that have tried to induce presence. All of those treadmills that didn't work out. We've had headsets for decades now. And we're still fighting as to whether or not they're going to make it this time. The future's looking better. Some people argue that VR in particular has come out of what's called the, the trough of disillusionment. So technologies come out, people are really excited about them. And then they enter this trough of disillusionment where they don't do the things that they promised and folks give up. And you have to keep enough people in to come out of the trough for technology to stay, to maintain. And if you look at the Gartner Research Company that does the uh, what's called a hype cycle, I think it was two years ago, three years ago, it was recently, they had issued a report suggesting that VR had come out of the trough of disillusionment, meaning that it may actually stick this time. Like people might actually continue to buy the things. Combination of superior experiences and price. You know, we're starting to see the payoffs. And one thing they'll argue is that gaming is probably not the killer app for VR. There's been a lot of discussions that the killer apps for VR are probably not going to be video. When I say killer app, you know what I'm referring to. Just like the thing that's going to make it work. And a lot of folks are suggesting it's really going to be social VR, simulations, uh, news coverage, 
movies, things like that. So it's an interesting debate we're having right now. Um, in part because games already do a good job of triggering some of these things. And in part because, think about it, if you're a gamer, do you always want presents? What? Do you always want presents? I usually do, personally. So you're playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, and you're shooting up an airport of civilians. Like, do you want to be in the shit, like, stabbing people in the heart and ripping it out, and, like, them shooting you and you get hurt? Uh, yeah. I'm going to guess probably not. Like, we think we do, but true presence would be, like, literally, has anybody seen the pain vest? Yeah. It'd be like... Why would you do that? Especially, like, in Ready Player One. Like, why would you... Like, in regards if you're going to be seen as a role of pain, why would you wear that? (laughs) It's a question, right? Well, the answer is, I want to be present. Mm -hmm. But we could debate, like, do we want presence? And so there's been some discussions about whether or not audiences really do want presence. Mm -hmm. And remember, not as a binary, but as a continuum. You know, that we may not want... 100% 100% presence all the time. That some experience we may want to be fantasy and not presence. And it's a it's a discussion. It's, it's something for future research that I think actually for anybody on the call who's thinking about studying these things. That's what our lab does, by the way. So we should talk. But it's a cool question of how much presence do we actually want. Riley, I think heuristically you're right. Like, yeah, I play video games because they're fun and presence is fun. But I think the question I'm asking is, is there a point at which presence is not fun anymore? Oh, definitely. And there probably is. You know, there's probably a threshold. And of course, the answer is probably it depends on the experience, right? Uh, There are some things I want a lot of. But think about this way. Why do they use flight simulators for pilots instead of planes? Because it wants... It's cheaper. Well, it's cheaper, but what's probably the more relevant reason? Safer. It's safer. You'll die if you crash the plane. (laughs) Like, we won't have many pilots. They're killed. Yeah, people die if they are killed. It's bad. So we start you off in an environment that's pretty realistic, but we scale it down a little bit because we want you to learn like the basic controls. And then once you learn the basic controls, we give you more things to control and then more things to control. And then super high resolution, high fidelity simulators that have motion. And then we put you in a plane finally. And we see how you handle a plane, right? And hopefully by that level, you, you've got you've got some basic idea of what's going on, right? So that would be a situation where we do not want you to have these things right away. Um, you may not want presence when things are super overwhelming. How many of you played the Surgery Simulator game? Or like any type of like... Sur- it's kind of fun. It's probably not how an operating room works. That's okay. They're focusing you on one thing, right? Um, I hope that's not what Tech Health is using for like their surgeons. We wouldn't have very good surgeries. You know. But eventually they do get that far. There's actually a great video online of a, a student who's studying to be a proctologist. And they have a VR simulation of colon exams. And the controller you have is a patient bent over a table. And of course the video out of context makes everybody giggle. Because it looks like a video game controller is a person bending over a table with a doctor examining the person's colon. And then on the screen, you see the colon. But it's not an entire dummy. It's just like their back half. So it's definitely a bit odd. Um, But that's probably an area where you do want a lot of presence once you're at that level of training. So another thing we can talk about. All right. I'm going to spend a little less time talking about narrative engagement. But I want to show the difference between the two. Okay, so the difference between places and spaces is really important. I'm not going to stream the videos here only because it may have some issues with streaming already with the recordings and such as that. But what you see on the screen here, this is from the Press Grove reading, the one I did with with Gia Press Grove. Um, These were 360 degree news cameras where we went into high schools in West Virginia that had been flooded. And, of course, documentaries take on-location film. That, that's not surprising. You've all seen a documentary, and they show things that happened, and there's a narrator who discusses it, and then you watch the documentary. Well, what was different about this particular video is that while we were there, we actually shot everything in 360. Yeah. So the camera picked up the entire environment. 
and then the camera and the software has the ability to stitch it together later. And then how do you tend to watch 360 videos? Uh, like on, like scrolling around it or... There's two big ones you can do. One is the scroll method where you have a device and you can actually move your screen and there will be footage all around you. And of course, what's the more natural version of that? The more immersive version of that? The VR. The headset, where we actually just put the videos into your headset, and then as your head moves around, you are able to control the camera. Which, for documentary and for news coverage, that's very brand new. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you think that the history of news media is to give your world to you, and as high of fidelity a way as possible, well, the next step in news coverage is 360 news. Where when someone's filming live on location at a protest, it's not a pancake anymore. It's you're literally in the protest. Right? Um, it's something that is very quickly... Does anybody own a 360 camera? I asked. Super expensive. It they 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 were and they still kind of are. They've started to come down to where they've actually gotten into the three figures now, which really surprised me. I didn't expect that. Um, super expensive. Oh, trust me, I'm not saying that 900 is cheap, but compared to like 30 grand, right? We're starting to see them come down. Um, a lot of folks. So so I think I've told you on the car on the call that one of my hobbies is I work on old cars. And a lot of classic car guys have been putting immersive cameras on their car during their rallies. So you can see all the other classic cars like in the in the rally or whatever. But of course, these cameras stitch together reality. Going back to Jared's point earlier, you're picking up on more visuals than you would normally pick up on that are a bit, bit more normal to your environment. You know, if we think of the pancake as a section of reality, well, the 360 camera is a more of a lived reality that I'm just letting you borrow my eyes for a while. And that's not something we've historically been able to do. Let somebody else borrow your eyes for a while, right? Um, what we had hoped to find in this study, what we thought would happen, was that if people, well, let's rewind. What is the point of most documentaries, just at the broad level? Inform. Definitely informational to give you some deep information about a topic that you're probably not very familiar with. What else? Entertainment. Entertainment, I'm going to argue, is a, is, a, is a lesser goal, but sure, it's there. I'd probably, like, take action. A lot of them have some, you know, they can have, like, a social justice angle. Regardless of what your what that justice is, but there could be, like, a you're seeing this thing happen... You probably didn't know about it. You should go do something about it now. Mm -hmm. Right? And they often... Document. Document. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, in some ways, they are very, very long forms of journalism. Right? They're probably meant to immerse you in an issue. So, I mean, think about it. When we get the news, how long do we normally pay attention to a given topic? A day, maybe. Sure, the, the one day that it was in the news. And then we move on. And when we get it, it's like a 30-second video or like a 400-word article in the newspaper. There's not much more to it than that. So documentaries are a, a form of very long journalism where you get one issue that you intensely focus on that's usually movie length, you know, one to three hours. And we're trying to immerse you in this experience narratively. So narrative engagement is this notion of connecting you to the story that's on screen. Yeah. Right? It's filmmaking. In fact, one of the reasons why I would say entertainment, and anybody on the call who's in CMI, documentary and films share many things in common. Like, many things in common. Um, they're not all that separate from each other on some dimensions, both production-wise and writing-wise. Right? Well... That's great for narrative engagement, but we had wondered if you give people these 360 videos on top of all of that other narrative information, maybe folks will connect even more strongly. Why would we think that? 
We had hoped that technology would actually aid in narrative engagement. Has like the sense of like presence, like putting you there, like you're more, you're not just like an audience watching something, you are like in the story kind of. That's that was good. kind of the hope. Like you're literally going to be there. So it's not just happening to some people on screen. In some ways it's happening to you. You're standing in the high school that was destroyed by floods and you're having to figure out how all of this stuff works and make sense of your surroundings. And it's one thing to see a photo of a tornado. It's another thing to walk up to it, like literally see the damage around you, the floodwaters around you, the walls all around you. And that was the idea behind this project. And I'm happy to share those videos if anybody wants to see them. They're, all, they're on YouTube. It was part of a larger project. And for the paper, I think there's a link in the paper to the videos. So you can watch those on your own. If you have a headset, great. You can watch them on a headset. Don't worry too much about the math here. Okay. Uh, for those of you who do research, this is a structural equation model where the concepts over here on the left side are predicting the concepts that come next. Uh, what's HMD mean? Head mounted display. Head mounted display. This would be, I think in this study, it was an Oculus Rift. 360 video. This is what Riley was talking about, where you're watching it on YouTube, but then you can click on the screen and you can move the video wherever you want to. Well, presence, we've already talked about. It's that illusion of non-mediation, right? It's that sense of being there. Narrative engagement for our research was feeling part of the story. Okay. Narrative engagement would be a, well, I'm using the word to define itself, a story feature. Presence would be more associated with technologies and the feeling they make you have. And then the rest of it's not overly relevant, but our hope is that people who felt higher levels of narrative engagement and higher levels of presence would have increased attitudes towards helping people out. And then at the end of the day, if you watch these videos, through these technologies, you'd be more inclined to actually help people. And Christina probably recognizes this model. It's it's the theory of planned behavior, right? How I feel about something predicts what I'll do, but that depends on what I think other folks think about it and do I think I have the ability to actually do it. So that's less relevant for our class, but some folks on the call will definitely recognize that model. So probably unsurprising, we found for sure that both technologies increased presence. The reason there are these A, Bs, and Cs, how many videos were in that study? It's kind of a reading check. Okay. There's three videos, right? And so the reason we do that in research, and Koji and Phil can tell you about this a little bit, is whenever you do research on media, if you only use one piece of content as your example, what's a limitation to your study? It's like people don't have the same kind of experience with the, like people can interpret different, people have different interpretations of that experience. And like if showing them more than one, you know, they might like another experience more than the other. Like it's basically like the deal with opinion slash. Yeah, that's a specific example of a broader topic and it's called monostimulus bias. If you only use one stimulus in your study, your effects might only apply to that one thing. Right. Right. So the fallout study, well, that study tells you a lot about fallout. And we're going to get there in a minute. We'll talk about that. Right. And there are reasons why you may or may not have different multiple, stu multiple stimulus in the same study. But you're right. You know, one is only one. And so if that type of material doesn't generalize very well, then you may have a lot of data about one thing. Right. Mm -hmm. In this study, we use three different videos all about floods but different stories about the same floods in different locations, different high schools, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these numbers here are the connection between the head mounted display and feelings of presence. All you need to know about these numbers is they can range from negative one to one. And the closer they get to the extremes, the stronger the effect. And just by eyeballing this, the head mounted display was much better at triggering presence than the 360 video. Why? Because... It essentially hijacks your senses more. Yeah, it's more immersive, exactly. You're literally getting more information, 
right? You're getting it through your senses. You're in control of it. The word hijack isn't an unfair word, right? It's taking you there. Whereas a 360 video, yeah, you could still see everything, but it's a bit unnatural and weird. Has anybody tried to watch a 360 video? There's, there's sometimes a bit disorienting because you got to click and drag around and sometimes you forget to reset the video and then you have a weird angle for a couple minutes and things like this. Yeah. But notice how there is almost no effect on narrative engagement. These are the numbers predicting like 360 videos to narrative engagement and HMD to narrative engagement. Oh, what? What's going on? Why weren't they engaging narratively? They weren't engaged because basically it's a separate thing. Um, you know, like basically the rules were that you can't like that increasing someone's presence will, you know, doing making something, giving them more immersive technology will increase their presence. But that's not going to make the story better or more engaging. One problem we might be having in tech right now is that presence doesn't tell better stories. Right. You may have to we may have to learn how to tell stories for 3D media. Right. And I don't know if we know how to do that right now. Yeah, it's the same with like let's say with like money, like money. The amount of budget you have for like a film does not determine how good it's going to be. Kind of, you know. Right. It can determine the advertising budget, and that can help, but it doesn't necessarily make it a better story. In this case, what we're seeing, I think, and this was a surprising finding. We actually had a lot of fights with people about this finding because the argument they were making is that narrative engagement and presence are the same thing. Now, they're correlated. These numbers in the middle show that, you know, as presence goes up, so does narrative engagement. Or as narrative engagement goes up, so does presence, but they are not the same thing. Uh, the, the research on the call will tell you these correlations are high, but they don't suggest these two things overlap. In fact, if you were to take these values and square them, that would be the amount of variance explained in one by the other, and those numbers are going to be below 20%. Mm -hmm. This does not tell me they're the same thing. It's also not surprising that they share some correlation. My guess is that if you feel as if you're in a physical, a digital world, you're probably more likely to feel as if you're in the story. But the effect is not that strong. Take this back to the history of film. And I think I covered this in our last conversation. The earliest films were of horses running, trains driving, people leaving factories. Those are great experiences on camera. Those aren't narratives. And it took us a while to learn how to tell a story with these new tools. And I think the example I used last time we talked was cut, cutting and splicing film, using more than one camera and then taking different cameras and putting their images together and you get a better story. I suspect that with 360 and 3D, We've not learned how to tell that story yet. What are some of the complications that come with telling a story in 360 degrees? Uh, people could miss visual details. To right. To see. Think about if you take in any film class, the importance of framing. Like the importance of framing things in a film and a scene. You can't control the scene anymore. Because you used to always be able to say, oh, the person's sitting behind a fourth wall. So I know their entire range of vision. I just have to arrange my scene in a way and cut my camera in a way to frame my shot and we're good. How do you frame a shot in 360 when, as Alex said, they could be looking anywhere? In fact, what happened in this study, anecdotally, when people would put the headset on and they would look around the room. So you see what's in front of us here? This recording? They wouldn't see any of that. Because what were they doing? Looking around. Looking around. And there was a narrator, so they didn't feel the need to read it. And that oftentimes, they were looking at things that from a narrative perspective weren't relevant to the story. So like birds flying overhead. Or a car driving by. And they would turn their head because they heard the car. But in a film, you can't do that. Like the director can set that in motion. So one is we can't control the user behavior. What are some other issues that might hinder the ability to tell films in 360?
It tells stories in 360, rather. Is it possible maybe one is like a... Maybe people around couldn't... Like, they're not as comfortable in a VR setting to stay as long. You know, like, maybe they don't want to be in the headset for two, three hours. Well, possibly, but I mean, in this study, it was it was three minutes. Right. Um, well, in that short period of time, it's much easier to adapt and get into something that you're much more, uh, that your senses are much more placed into than if it's on a screen. Because I could sit down and see the news, but I don't get immersed in the news after three minutes because there's this whole world around me other than the news. But if I'm standing there and everything that I am experiencing, at least on my head, is mm -hmm. through this medium, then that's going to definitely take my senses and place them in that, and I'm going to feel more immersed as a result. Well, and, and, and to be clear, the immersion, the technology side, you're going to feel presence as a result of the immersion. What we're seeing here, though, and, and that's not debated, right? What we're seeing is the, the narrative part's just not getting any better. Um, I suspect that today's CMI students are going to be the ones that solve this because the technologies aren't going away, right? I think it's a big unanswered question. Like, how do we reconceptualize the entire notion of film production to understand that users can now look everywhere. And that's going to be a weird one. You know? Um, I know when James Cameron released Avatar, does anybody remember what was particularly unique about that film? It had 3D. Yeah, like, the whole thing was 3D. shot in 3D. And he talks about how it changed the way he had to frame his shots. Now, you didn't have to see it in 3D, right? But he filmed it in 3D. Um, but even that still, it's in front of you. It just has depth now. Now it's, it's in front of you. It has depth and also it's all around you. It's an unanswered question, but I think it told us something about the limitations of technology, you know, and it may be more on the directors and the developers and the writers to figure out how to reconceptualize narratives when the user has ultimate experience. You're also going to see a lot more partnerships between gaming companies and I think movie comp and film companies because the technology are starting to clash into each other. You know, uh, and that's going to be interesting because the, the, the developers in games understand user behavior. Whereas in film, you never really had to think about user behavior that much and now suddenly you do, right? Um, one of the things we found is basically there is a difference between being in a place and being in a story. And again, that might sound a bit silly for our conversation, but this is something in research that has often been confused. And in fact, some of the students on the call, the grad students who have taken these courses have been taught that like narrative engagement involves presence. And we're seeing empirically that it doesn't. There's separate things. And we can demonstrate that by manipulating the technology and showing that one thing goes up but that the other thing doesn't go up. And if you can show that differential variance, that has implications. So my hope is that papers like this one are gonna help us better understand the limitations of what we're working with here. And one of them is simply putting a helmet on somebody doesn't make them more involved in the story. And I'm sure that many of you on the call that have used VR have had plenty of crappy experiences. Because a lot of developers are still, I think, stuck in that. Well, if I make it VR, people are going to love it. And they're like, oh, you didn't actually take advantage of the medium. You know, you didn't actually program this to take advantage of the situation around me. And I'd rather have this flat. I haven't played No Man's Sky yet. I've been told it's pretty good. But, you know, there are other experiences where the VR version isn't all that great. You know. Let's see. Um... So uh, an real quick, yeah, sure. With the No Man's Sky one, I can I can definitely agree with that because, like, when you look at it, they they marketed it in such a way. Even when it just came out, they marketed it in such a way that sort of went to the wrong audience, and that's why I had a bad rating at first. But then it went good when it went to the right audience. But same thing with VR; it was marketed as the great space exploration game where everything is smooth and seamless. And you know, once you get into it and you try flying a ship, for example. It is anything but smooth. Right. For the first month, if there was a notification, you couldn't turn it off, and that made it absolutely awful to play. Sorry, he was 
No, it's okay. These are all examples of where we're trying to figure some of this stuff out, you know? Um, and it's important for young technologies because audiences don't have a lot of forgiveness, right? Games are established enough to where games can screw up and the medium's not going to die, right? But think back to what Alex said a moment ago about cost. If you put a lot of money into something and people keep making mistakes with it and the software breaks and then eventually it falls out of favor, that really sets back development. I have a colleague named Tony Lau who talks about this with AR technologies and why Google Glass failed, basically. And he talks a lot about, you know, some of the social missteps that led to some of these things falling apart. Absolutely. A takeaway from that study, immersion does not equal narrative. Right? Anybody recognize what's on screen right now? That is IKEA Simulator VR. Yeah, it's IKEA VR. Super popular program. I think it, it's a default on many of the VR headsets now. It's a brilliant marketing move on IKEA's behalf. It lets you literally, like, you know, experience, you know, put all the stuff in your kitchen. It's highly immersive. You know, surprisingly good resolutions and images. Like, really, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, there's no narrative. There's no attempt at a narrative. It's not the point, right? Um, they're just trying to get you to engage their products so that you'll buy them, right? Um, and we're seeing lots of other companies doing this um, 3D branding. Um, a lot of car companies are doing this now, where you can you can download a car to your headset and you can like walk around it, get inside of it, pop the hood, take pieces off of it. Um, it's why, and why would they do that from a brand management perspective? Uh, when you have that, when you can see it, uh, in a, as close to a in-person experience as possible, it leads you to want it in person more. Right. Absolutely. You can literally visualize having held this thing, Right. Um, it's, it's an, ex it becomes an experience good. And we know from diffusion of innovation research, that trial ability is a really critical factor in predicting adoption of something. And you're literally getting a trial. How much does it cost them? Yeah. The cost of making the program once, once you've done, once it's out there, it's free. You know, once it's out there, right? There's obviously costs that go into making it, but they are what they are, you know? We're going to see a lot more of these. In fact, HTC has an entire advertising wing. So HTC is one of the big developers, the Vive, right? And um, they have an entire office in Taipei that is developing uh, 3D VR and AR advertising. And they're seeing some success with it in, in, in Taiwan. Anybody want to take a guess at what sector they're seeing a lot of success with? Uh, what do you mean? Real estate. Why real estate, Riley? You can get a whole house tour, I guess. Yeah. Without having to take you anywhere. Uh huh. Anything. Yeah. You can do like office tours, house tours, like super high resolution, very authentic tours of buildings that you might purchase. It's not bad. Think about how much time it takes to go on a housing tour. And so cutting down that time by going, here's your headset. You know. So, do they build like three D models, or do they do like the three D photo scan? I've seen yeah. both. I, I I I've seen all three. I've seen three sixty. I've seen whole builds. I've seen photo scans. I think it just depends on how much money they want to spend on it. My guess is that um, full builds would be cost prohibitive, you know. But the photo scans, the three sixty. Yeah, but I've seen them all. You know, everything in between. Supremely popular. Supremely popular. Um, makes a lot of sense. Like you can do a housing tour before you get here. Imagine if the landlords in Lubbock actually, you know, had 360 videos of the place you're going to rent in town before you got there. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, I have a house here in Lubbock and before we got it, we could do a virtual tour. Yeah. We're but seeing even low level. Yeah. I think you're right. I, I think it's becoming, I wouldn't say expected, but increasingly common. It was surprising. It was just like, do a virtual tour now. And then we could look at see like inside yeah and they probably did one of the like the relatively inexpensive 3d cameras yeah. um it's kind of neat it's not bad i'll tell you it makes me feel better 
You know, I, when I was getting my place, I could see what was what I was going to get into before I got it. You know, not a bad way to go. But it's an example of immersion being a presence variable that doesn't necessarily need narrative and vice versa. You can have narratives, not any immersion. Right. We know that, of course. All right. Let's go to the last one. And for this one, what I'm going to do is this paper was just published recently out of my lab. I'm going to present the conference public, the version of my talk. And then at the end of it, we'll talk about sense of place and then we'll connect everything together. So these are actually slides that I presented recently to the American Psychological Association. And so I just repurposed them for today. And so I'll kind of walk you through how this project came to be. And then I'll probably hold some of the questions towards the back. That said, if you have an itching, burning desire, just throw your hand up. It's no big deal. So first off, has anybody here played Fallout 76 before? Right. So this is this was this um, game in the Fallout franchise, and was what was supposed to make it different was that it was everybody in the environment was supposed to be another human player, like with the exception of mostly dead people, <laughs> well entirely dead people, and uh, monsters here and there, and there are like remnants of people's stories, but every time you encountered somebody, they were human. And of course, the story behind the game is that it takes the Fallout universe, if folks aren't familiar with it, it involves nuclear war, pretty much explains most of it, back to after the bombs originally fell. And so Fallout 76 was this fictitious shelter. Where was it at, the shelter? It's in West Virginia. West Virginia. Does anybody know the history behind that? So there's some parallels with reality here already. It was one of the biggest nuclear bunkers that were supposed to stop some sort of nuclear mass blast that was built below the Capitol. Is that what it was? Not below the Capitol, below a country club called the Green. Uh, and the game's called the Green. Bri oh, actually, I sometimes yeah. forget the name. In real life, it's called the Greenbrier. <laughs> um, why West Virginia? And so it was a bunker, and actually, more importantly than that, it was built to house Congress. So in the event of a nuclear strike, they would evacuate the capital and send people to West Virginia. Why West Virginia? It's in the middle of nowhere, basically. Well, lots of places in the middle of nowhere, though. Why West Virginia in particular? Close enough to D.C. and not a target. Say again? It's close enough to D.C. and it's not a target. The key is that it's close enough to D.C., and it's, it is rural. It's also hard to attack because it's mountainous. Uh, the entire state exists in Appalachia. You know, so there are two major mountains chains in the United States. You know, the Rockies and the Appalachians. West Virginia is squarely in the center of the mountains. Not too far by miles from the capital, but its terrain, its ruralness made it a really good getaway. Right? This is all going to be important for the notion of sense of place. Um, so the game borrows for some lore about, you know, Appalachia and sort of its sort of like weird shadowy history with the government, you know, and it's got this fallout shelter. And so West Virginians are the people that emerge from the shelter first. Anything you know about sort of that population of people in terms of like stereotypes, in terms of the way we talk about like Appalachia culture? When you hear coal miners and, and, you know, what do you think of? I'm just curious how much you have of, like, the idea of a West Virginian. Um, uh, I don't know. I would think of uh, probably something, uh, some weird blend of uh, redneck culture. And so walk me through redneck, redneck culture because redneck culture actually came from West Virginia. Um, what does it mean to be a redneck? Well, a redneck, redneck means like it, your neck is red from doing like farm work and doing manual labor all day. So describe that person yes. though, in like broader cultural terms, like why would they be the ones to survive nuclear war? <laughs> uh, you trust their own stuff. Say again. They don't trust like government help. They They're the they rebels. Know. They're the like hard scrabble, blue collar, dirt under your nails. Don't tell me no. 
Of course, there's all sorts of negative stereotypes about Appalachia. We can we can set those aside for a moment, but they're there. But there's this sense of like like survival. Appalachia is one of the poorest areas of the country. Lowest salaries, highest unemployment, high drug use rates. It is hard to live in Appalachia. People just don't live there. And if you ever drive through the Appalachia Mountains, they're pretty. They're really hard to imagine somebody living in them. Especially by contemporary U.S. standards. You know, you still have like shack housing and things like that, right? The term redneck actually... Anyway. What's that? They live there anyway. And you live there anyway. And I'll be damned if I'm going to leave, right? And there's all sorts of reality shows based in West Virginia. It's usually the redneck is like loud and kind of out there and super tough and ready for a fight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the term redneck actually came from miners who fought the National Guard. Uh, the National Guard took over the mines in, in, in the uh, western part of West Virginia and about 10,000 miners put on red handkerchiefs and fought them. Um, and, the, and the National Guard ceded the mines back to the miners. Like, that's some hardcore stuff. Um, and for better or for worse, like I, you know, we're celebrating it, but there's also a lot of problems with that, right? Um, but nonetheless, it's this idea of like rugged. And so the game taps into that idea of ruggedness. Appalachia, survival, nuclear war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I'm seeing some puzzled looks on the call, and that's going to be part of the point as we go through this presentation. Because I think if you were to ask West Virginians these things, they'd have very different answers. And my answers align more with theirs because I was there for 10 years. And so I got to know that this culture a lot more than my previously existing stereotype, which was like dumb yokels. I don't know. Because... I only do things from like Beverly Hillbillies and stuff like that, right? Mm. Games are very often tap in to real places. So why is the cathedral at Notre Dame on screen right now? Because it was a pretty much one to one recreation in Assassin's Creed. Yeah. The real place before it burned out. And so you may have all read for folks on the call that a lot of folks have been using the Assassin's Creed Unity build of the cathedral to help in the actual restoration efforts. Why would Assassin's Creed, of all the buildings in that game, have put so much detail into a building that, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember it playing like a huge role in the game. No. Sometimes but, you can um, like look at a building and the game will give you... like. Um, you know, press select to learn more about this building. So why would they do that for a building that wasn't even that big of a deal for the overall game narrative? Just because it's a things. famous. It's famous. Uh, they can advertise that they have it. They sure. Be like, hey, we have this whole one-to-one -one recreation of Notre Dame. There's some social. All these other things that we have in our game. Some social cap and people would recognize this one. They wouldn't recognize the other buildings. If anybody's been to Paris. There's other buildings in Paris, but this one's recognizable. Riley, you were talking about the historical connection. If I'm not mistaken, Assassin's Creed kind of prides itself on, like, getting involved in history. I mean, all of the storylines engage history. They engage alternative histories, but that's sort of their bread and butter. They sell a quasi-replication, semi-authentic, alternative history science fiction concept. It's because of this game series that I thought I wanted to be a history teacher when I first entered college. And I was like, no, I just like Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Sometimes your hobby just is better as your hobby than as your job. <laughs> but Assassin's Creed sells that, right? Like a big part. I don't know if anybody on the call reads alternative history. I, I do quite a bit, like alternative history novels. And this is a good example of one, like in the flesh. We're going to play. So how can you have an alternative history game? if you don't know history well enough to know these big buildings. So I think all of your answers have some level of, of correctness to them. And again, just to reiterate, for a building that actually isn't that important otherwise, like it's a background prop. It does tell you you're in Paris immediately. But beyond that, eh. But I think you're all right. If it wasn't there, people would have noticed. And what's happened on the other side of the screen? Did you recognize that game? A Splinter Cell? Or... No, I... Actually, no, I'm forgetting the name of it. 
It was the one that came out last year, and they Did mapped. The yeah, they mapped the city of Washington D.C. one to one. On the top is a camera shot of the Washington Monument from Google Maps. On the bottom is the same exact angle in the video game. It's not just oh hey it's the monument. So walk me through what else is in there that uh, makes those shots one to one. Trees. The tree uh, line is the same. The grass. the grass slope is the same. Like man, this is a really good one to one rendering of a real place. Uh, Jeremy Smith on the call is like it's very relatable almost immediately, especially if you've been there. Like. Maybe those details don't matter that much, but they do if you've been there, right? And we start to notice these things like that. That that game still shocks me with how much. And if you've ever been to DC, people have talked about like seeing their coffee shop in the video game. You know, so we definitely see these things going on. And of course, don't worry about this. I'm sure we probably have examples. This is from the actual chat with with. Well, I guess have you anybody on the call seen a real life location in a video game? I got an example. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I've been playing flight sims a good amount since I've been interested in flight. And then recent, most recently, the new Microsoft Flight Simulator came out. One of the biggest appeals of it was the advancements and basically creating the the world in a realistic, true to life way. Because in the old simulators uh, that were made like more than a decade ago with Microsoft, um, you fly, let's say, love it. There's not much too recognizable. It was a very standard because it was a, an older game. If you fly it in the new one, I get a very big sense of place because I can find my house. I can find tech. I can find the roads. I'm like, here's 82nd Street. Here's Indiana. Here's University. Mm -hmm. I can find any, like almost any building within love again to send now. Someone put up, like, yeah, on Reddit, the day that game came out, about an hour after the game came out, someone put a video up from the flight simulator flying over campus. Yeah. I mean, it took like not even a day. And like lots of people engaged the post. And you know those people are not flight simulator fans. Yeah. But they're like, whoa, that's in a video game. It's crazy. It's amazing. I don't know if you saw it or not too, but it was like, I mean, within a day, you had a you had a campus flyover. Yeah. You know. So it's everybody very, did. Very, very cool. The cooler experience because it kind of enhances the feeling of flight and like, again, sense of place. Right. I recognize this area i've been here and importantly for sense of place there's an emotional connection too and i'll talk about that here in a bit anybody else like had a, a game or a vr experience where you've actually been there before and someone oh this is cool hold on a second so um uh, uh matt uh talked about uh being an archival intern at the national archives in dc and then playing fallout 3 that would be and matt were you living there when fallout 3 came out i'm just curious He's on our chat window. Because I could definitely see that happening. Like, the, those those experiences happen. Um, I know for me, I've played games. I'm going to bring the chat into our uh, into our ongoing uh, video call, capture here. Uh, but I could definitely... Uh, Matt, was there anything that stood out when you were in Fallout 3? Did, did you recognize anything? Or just kind of a, a general sense of, wow, I have connections to DC, and now I'm playing a video game with those same connections? I'm just curious. so those things happen a lot right um yeah the reading rooms you talk about you know going in there and like you know being in the archives working in the archives and having all these experiences and and sometimes they don't have to be a one-to-one -one reflection but just enough to trigger that reminder right um if i'm not mistaken there's been a fallout game that took place in boston of course you know um can you think of other video games or other vr experiences that are like they replicated yeah. a real place Spider-Man? Spider-Man New York um, City. But I mean, like, so do you... Spider-Man 2 for the GameCube was, like, a fa more faithful recreation of Manhattan, and I could find the apartment that I used to stay at when I was there. Yep. Uh, in Spider-Man for the PS4, that uh, that building doesn't exist. Interesting. And so you can notice when they're gone, too, right? So, for like, for me, I've actually never spent any appreciable time in Manhattan um, Spider-Man seems realistic, but, like, I can see the whatever tower and the, like, school and the tourism attractions, right? But I wouldn't recognize the small things. Uh, Jeremy talked about Gran Turismo. 
You know, and both being in the actual car interiors and then also being on the tracks. And if you're somebody who's in the cars, that game has been pretty lauded for these kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go back here. So, sense of place is defined as to know a place fully means to understand it in an abstract way and to know it as one person knows another. And the idea here is you have knowledge and connection. Okay. So what's on the screen? Anybody recognize that? That's St. Louis skyline. And that's my hometown. So for a lot of you, you're like, oh, it's the arch. I've heard of that. Um, does anybody recognize any buildings in that shot? I'm just curious. Or anything at all, for that matter, in the shop, besides the arch. Ballpark is back there. Stadium's back in the corner there. So if you're a baseball fan, you might recognize that. Yeah, it's back over here. Yeah, I haven't been to St. Louis before. Yeah. My dad, I could call my dad and he'd probably recognize What's this before. body of water in front? Um, it's the Mississippi. It's what cuts the country basically in half, right? St. Louis was the gateway to the West. That's why they built the arch to symbolize westward expansion. And we can definitely critique that looking back, right? Mm -hmm. For me, uh, you may recognize the court in the center. That's where the Dred Scott trial was held. And so for history majors and minors, that's a really important building. Um, Missouri had a very complicated relationship with slavery. When I see this photo, I recognize this building here because I used to work on the top floor is a PR executive. I recognize this building here because it's the federal courthouse and I was a journalist who covered the courts for a long time and so I spent a lot of time in this building here, right? Um, I can tell you that behind this cluster of trees is the Adams Mark Hotel and the behind that is a really great bar called Cicero's and I would hang out in there all the time. I can tell you the best pizza place in St. Louis is an Emo's down Market Street here, but it's about 10 blocks back. The point I'm making, of course, is many of us can probably recognize some of the abstract symbols. But for some of us, we have these emotional connections where we remember the places and our experiences in those places, which is kind of what Matt was getting at a little bit with the National Archives. Like you start to have that connection or maybe even feel like it's a different reaction when you see your apartment. Because then you start thinking about, oh, yeah, then I would walk down the street and like this was over here and that was over there. And then when some of those things are there, it's fantastic. It's an even more intense experience, right? Video games can definitely trigger this sense of place. Um, these abstract understandings and these affective familiarities, these emotions. What's on screen? Like the... Uh... Zelda what? The original Legend of Zelda map. This is the full map, right? And anybody who's played this game probably memorized this map. And in fact, what's right in the middle is somebody produced a two-bit version of Zelda. And believe it or not, if you've played Zelda, the two-bit version is shockingly playable. Hmm. Like, even though, look at the level of abstraction there. That's just a comparison to that particular scene from this level and then the two bit version. And it's 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 wild. Like it's it's surprisingly playable game. Actually it might even be a one bit version where it's just one pixel per element. Um so most of us have the abstract knowledge of the game. But some of us might even have emotional connections to like that level up here where I wasn't it right around here where you can get lost if you don't walk through the maze in a certain way? Yeah, it's that one right there. Yeah, so I remember walking, going down for freaking hours and then not realizing that you have to actually go a different way to get down here. You, you can't just walk this way, right? And I think there's another one on the right side of the map. There might well be. and you, But you remember, like, the frustration that came with it. Or you remember, like, the, the joy of beating that one level or that one little annoying freaking mermaid that would pop out of the river right here and always cap you as you're walking by. Like, you have those connections as well. And so they're your more personal connections. And they can happen in any space that you spend time in, in any space that you develop a connection for, right? Fallout 76 worked in part going into this like stereotype of the hillbilly in Appalachia. And actually a lot of people in West Virginia were like, man, it's kind of cool that we get to be us in a video game now. 
Um, this is a copy of the Moth. Does anybody know the story of the Mothman? In Fallout 76? Or... Well, so here's the thing. They're the same story. The one in Fallout 76 is mostly the same as the one in real life. So it's a cryptozoological creature. Right, which means it's like a, a bear, a, a Bigfoot, or a, you know, some hybrid animal man creature um, that was blamed for wrecking a bridge in, in the city. And I'm actually blanking on the name of the city right now. Point Pleasant. Um, and it was the bridge that goes over to Ohio, which, by the way, in the game, the bridge is also out. But in the game, it's out for functional reasons. They don't want you to go any further on the map. So it's very clever to put it on the very edge of the map, right? Um, and it stalks people. You know, it's sort of one of these class. There's actually a Mothman Prophecies movie from the 80s, which is basically what the Mothman's based off of. In fact, in the video game, the Mothman will stalk you as well. Although there are different, if you remember, Alex, there's different kinds of moth. There's like one that's intelligent and there's one that's brutal and there's one that's passive and a bunch of different things here. Um, the game not only took like the, the stereotype of the hardworking person, like the coal miner and things like that. The game also has parts throughout it well, there are protests between miners and machines. What is that sort of reminiscent of? You know, those are labor struggles we see today. You know, in the 1900s, your average mine might employ a couple hundred people. By 2000, your average mine would employ 16 to 24 people because you have automatic mining machines and things like that. So the game even worked in like political struggles. It worked in like local lore. So the Mothman is pretty well known. But there are other creatures in West Virginia history that aren't nearly as well known, like the Flatwoods Monster and the, um, oh man, and, and the, the Granville Monster. There's a couple monsters in the game that are, in the game, really important, but they're myths, right? Those things would matter if you had sense of place. For most of the folks on the call, this stuff's just kind of going over your head a little bit. Right, uh, Benjamin mentioned whenever there was a Mothman disaster follows, right? But if you knew the state of West Virginia and you knew its culture, these things would be like instant hits because you grew up with these stories. Um, I suspect Texas has similar ones. There might be like local legends and local lores. Um, I know the idea the jackalope floats around in the Southwest a lot. Anybody heard of that one? Mm. It's like the yeah. jackrabbit with ant with deer antlers and you know things of this nature, you know. So going through this a little more, one of our ideas was that okay, you got this game called Fallout seventy six. It takes place in West Virginia. How big is West Virginia as a state? Dude. Uh, in terms well, of population. Uh, it's really really small population wise. Seven. What's that? <laughs> no. At least seven. It's small. It's very small. It's in the bottom 45th. Like, it's way down at the bottom. Um, I think the... Oh, I used to know the numbers. Um, did you say seven million? Is that what you said? No, I just said seven. Seven, yeah. It's, it's not very many. I believe the metropolitan area of Houston it has more people than the entire state of, of West Virginia. Like, it's a very small state population wise it might even be like 1.2 million anyway you can you can google it on your own 1.79 yeah. million tiny as of 2019 like compare like that would fit in houston with room right uh. um the point is you're releasing a game that takes place in a small state in a small rural state that's hard to get to with very few people from it how many folks are going to have experience with west virginia who are playing this game just probabilistically uh, not many not very all. many. Maybe more than you would expect because they might be more likely to play it, but probably not very many. So from a research perspective, it gave us the unique opportunity to study an environment that is real and compare people who know the environment from people who don't know the environment, which is really critical for sense of place. Right. Um, someone asked about Apricot Moonshine. Funny thing about that is if you've played Fallout 76, Moonshine's a big part of the game. In fact, in one of the patches later on, they released a distillation unit you could put in your cabin to make different flavors of Moonshine. 
And there's even one uh, quest, a side quest, where some college students at Vault Tech University, West Virginia University, made a special kind of moonshine that basically gave you like psychedelic powers. So, Jeremy, you're talking about that, and literally, those are like the stereotypes of moonshine times eleven, right? So our basic idea was that I bet you we could find people with with uh, experience in the state and people without it. And then before playing the game, we'd probably expect those scores to be very different. If you don't know West Virginia, just like the photo of St. Louis, no, I don't know any of this stuff. I don't know what you're talking about, Nick. I've never been there before. Whereas I'm from there, know it all. I think you get the point. We tracked people over time. And so a lot of folks said, why did you study Fallout? These were the reasons why. It wasn't that Fallout was super good at including sense of place it's that it was a real place people could have been to but we have variation between people who have and people who haven't and we know the game will be played long term in fact the fact that the game wasn't very good was great for our research because what did it what did it mean for the number of folks who started it at time one compared to time three what was going to happen if the game's not good not going to play it again they're not going to play again which means we can now compare people who stopped playing to people who are still playing and from a research perspective that's really important to have comparison groups so the game gave us two really important groups folks who are from west virginia and folks who aren't folks who are still playing the game and folks who aren't and that's why we use this particular game. A lot of folks ask that question like, that game sucked, why did you use it? I'm like, well, from a research perspective, it was the perfect game to use because it had this configuration of experience and continued play, okay? Uh, survey, about 600 people. We followed them over time. We interviewed them right before the game came out, right after the game came out, and then two months after the game came out. Um, Average age of 30, which is pretty good for a game study. This meant it wasn't just college students, right? We got pretty wide range of gamers, mostly white, uh, most uh, not as many, not overwhelmingly male, but more males than females, mostly in the U.S. And as you probably expect, about 25% of them were from West Virginia, and the rest of them weren't. So it gave us all those comparison points, right? Um, this part's kind of interesting. It talks about how you measure sense of place and you can read it up on your own but uh, basically do you feel connected inspired fulfilled alive um, is it meaningful to you is it a sacred place is it a memorable place and so like you know matt you can think about dc and the archives and maybe some of these scores would be like not super high but they would be like higher right because you've been there before for me for st louis sense of connection inspired fulfilled appreciation those things are really high for me and for other people, not so much. You can imagine people playing, you know, Assassin's Creed and seeing the cathedral. And some of these scores would be higher than the other scores. And that all, I think, kind of makes sense. Um, and then we ask people, how many places can you remember from the state? And um, we'll get to that here in a minute. All right. So here's what we found. Sense of place in the beginning. The people over here are folks who are not from the state. And the people over here, I think you can see my mouse, are the folks that are from the state. Of course you expect the people from West Virginia to have a deeper sense of place than the folks who aren't. Of course you do. But everybody in this box was still playing the game after three months. And sure enough, this person here represents a person who's not from West Virginia and is not playing Fallout. What happens to their scores after playing? They go up. And they stay up across two months. These bars represent error. This has to do with, you know, the variance and the scores between. The point of this slide is all the people here have similar levels of sense of place. Again, folks who are not from the state and folks who are from the state. The people who are foreign to West Virginia after playing a video game that was based in West Virginia, their scores increase. But only if they're still playing. 
over here, these are all folks who stopped playing the game at some point. Well, if you're from West Virginia, no longer playing Fallout is probably not going to lower your sense of place for your home, right? For the people who are foreign, their scores initially go up. And then they drop down. And what we argued here is that video games like this can actually foster a sense of place for a real place, even if you've never been to it before. That your only experience is digital, but only if you keep playing. If you were to ask people if they enjoyed the game, these people had an average rating of the game of about 73 out of 100. Not a blockbuster score, but not a bad score. These people's average ratings were 56 out of 100. They didn't like the game very much. This finding was interesting because we were able to get those comparisons. It wasn't just that West Virginians have a higher sense of place than non-West Virginians. That would not be at all interesting. What is interesting is that we were able to foster a sense of place among a population who had never actually been there before. And then there was a lot of reporting in the data that like, oh yeah, man, I'm going to plan a trip there one of these days. Um, I want to go see the teapot. Um, I want to see if this place is real or if that one's not. And you can probably guess in West Virginia, they're doing a lot of tourism based around Fallout now. Um, it got hurt a little bit because again, overall, the game didn't do that well. And so now there's been a little bit of like, okay, never mind. We don't want to attach ourselves to that. But going into the development, the state was very much working with the developers to like get all these things on board. Okay. Pretty much the same findings. If you ask people what places they could recognize, same finding. If you weren't from the state, you had very low recognition. As you played for a while, your recognition went up, but then it would go back down again. Okay. Digital experiences can foster an authentic sense of place, even for people without experience. And that's going to be really important for VR and gaming development. Think about the implications of this for tourism in a time of COVID, where I could give you a digital experience and you can go somewhere virtually and it's not a meaningless trip because it's not real that we can actually start fostering these deeper connections to locations that might encourage you to actually go later. Um, somebody on the chat boards asked about that specifically. Um, I'm trying to find the question. Um, Alex, it may have been yours, and you were talking about like virtual tourism of Japan. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, uh, there's this franchise called Yakuza. I don't know if anybody's ever played it. But in the Yakuza franchise, there's this one central town you're in, which is called Kamurocho. Mm -hmm. It is basically a pretty much one-to-one -one real life recreation of real life Kabukicho. Yeah. My friend Tom uh, went to Japan a few years ago and he had played the Yakuza games and he was walking through Kabukicho. At first he didn't know where he was, but then he was like, wait a minute, I recognize this street. I know where that is. Right. That store is going to be over there. Holy crap, I'm here. It's actually there. Yeah. yeah. No, we're definitely seeing this. And I'm surprised how much we've not studied it. In part because the idea of sense of place historically isn't a very well-known one. Um, it comes from cultural geography, which is sort of the, the, the um, humanities approach to studying geography. So geography is a study of places, and most of the time it's like legal boundaries, political boundaries, resource boundaries. It's very objective. It's very numeric in nature. And there are a group of geographers who are like, yeah, but there's also the human experience of geography. And they just weren't taken all that seriously. Concepts like sense of place speak really strongly to the human experience of places. To the point where, yeah, that's pretty wild, Alex. So, like, this person can be on a street in Japan and know where they're at. And not just because they memorize things, but they actually have a connection to the place. You know? Now, it may not be a connection that translates one-to-one. -one, 
but most of our connections don't, right? Many folks who are from Lubbock experience Lubbock differently than students who aren't. And we all form our own connections. And that's what Tuan was getting at when he mentioned this idea of the, you know a place like you know a person. And we're seeing that it's not just presence. It's not just being there. It's the act of having actually lived it, played it, walked around it, touched things, right? It's more than just seeing it on a screen. Right? And that's the part that we're trying to unlock. Now, in this study, we did not study presence. And that's the biggest question we get. Um, we weren't interested in presence. But I think that a really good study would be trying to map out narrative engagement, connection to a story, presence, feeling like you're in an environment, and sense of place, feeling a connection to the space. That those three things might be separate paths towards a better understanding of digital experiences. And they probably complement each other. And that's the part where I think this research is going to go. Um, and that's the part I'm pretty excited about, right? Um, someone asked about like, if someone develops a sense of place on an inaccurate, and you said inaccurate medium, and I think what you might mean is like an inaccurate representation or representation of the medium. Um, the sense of place popularity. Uh, I don't know. So that's always the question that's asked because most game based places are like destroyed on fire. Yakuza, right? Like, yeah, you're in this village, but you're also a mobster and you're shooting things or yeah, you're in Appalachia, but you're being chased by zombies. Right. Um, that's a good question. It doesn't seem to be diminishing the effect. It doesn't seem to be like making it worse. Say it again, Phil. The Persona series and the latest Persona, like you're just a student in Tokyo. You're not doing anything supernatural in the real world. Yeah, so we, we can, that, I think it's an empirical question. Like, how does that affect sense of place? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. It certainly changes the affective relationship you would have with the place because your role in the place is different. And that would be a really cool research project to see if you could manipulate people's affective connections based on their role in the place and then seeing if presence impacts that as well. Like that's a really good question. And again, part of this class is every bit about trying to find those unanswered questions as it is about learning what the facts are, because we're the ones that are in the middle of developing these things. Like we don't have answers yet. And I think some of these discussions are the things that we're going to be tackling over the next five to 10 years, you know, and this was one of them. Uh, this part's not very relevant. It's about scale design. It'd be relevant to Phil's project, but not relevant for the rest of class right now. Um, we might wonder about those demands from last week, how they impact things. So like if you're in a space and you have to solve lots and lots and lots of puzzles, you may not be able to form a really strong connection to the environment because you're not focused on it. Right? It's the uh, 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 Horizon Zero Dawn effect, right? Beautiful, lush environments. But if you're focused on one thing, not other things or thinking about VR. If you've got crappy equipment, right. Or your equipment requires a lot of physical demands. It might hinder your ability to form emotional connections with the space or the physical command demands might become part of the connections. Uh, there are like some VR rock climbing simulators where that is the goal, right? Um, social VR could change things a little bit, right? So if you're in social spaces, and you're forming connections to these environments, that could matter. So all these things from the last time we met and this time all kind of, you know, uh, 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 come together at some point. And then, you know, the biggest critique, using a game that was more successful. But one point I might make is that if we found effects with a crappy game, imagine what we'd find with a good game. Assassin's Creed 2. Yeah, like imagine what we'd find if we used good games that people really enjoyed, right? That I, I do know if you go to Boston, to Paris, and some other places where Assassin Creed is, Assassin's Creed has been, they do Assassin's Creed tours. Like they're actually pretty popular. I'm gonna have to check that out. Um, if anybody has class with Dr. Peasley, the chair of CMI, his research is on the effects of entertainment and tourism. And he and I have been talking a lot about how we can use sense of place to understand media based tourism. Because if the, the, you can see the connection there is really, really close. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got about five or six minutes left. 
First off, let's make sure I didn't miss anybody's questions. Are there things that are on your mind right now, sort of burning thoughts you want to make up in the conversation right now? And I could definitely turn to my board, of course, and, and, and pull some of these out. Let's see here. So one person asked about sense of place, and they said one of the reasons is that if people didn't feel a sense of effective attachment or knowledge, they stopped playing the game. Does this mean that one's experience and general level of enjoyment affects the potential sense of place one draws from a game environment? So something interesting about sense of place that we did not capture in this research is that it doesn't always have to be positive. Can you think of any examples where you may have a negative sense of place? Um, by negative, you mean like not liking the place or like... Are there places in your life that you have very negative associations with? Oh. So I think the answer is yes, we definitely can. Uh, uh, for me, it was my, my, my first visit to New Delhi and um, touring the outskirts uh, of a large metropolitan city in India and coming face to face with poverty at levels that I had never seen before, where I felt guilty that I had a wallet. Like it was that level of just visceral, like I felt ashamed to walk through this village as I was going from my hotel to get dinner. It was that level of poverty where you're like, who am I to have any of this? And I was all, I still think about that. At any time I see a news story out of India or someone talks about New Delhi and they'll talk about like traveling and touring there, I can't think about it. I can't shake this feeling I had of just guilt. Like, actual factual like the very definition of privilege guilt i didn't do anything wrong i was just going from a hotel to get dinner and i walked down the wrong alley and i mean wrong meaning the alley they didn't want us to see because for tourists they treat us very differently right they're like you're westerners we want you to spend money and celebrate us and this was hidden but i, I went down the alley anyway and i remember just being like completely floored and trying to make sense of my surroundings. And so it's a very, uh, um, you know, avoidant response where I like, I get really, really uncomfortable even thinking about it. You know, so it's very negative, but it's still an affective connection to a place and knowledge of the place. I can point to you on the map where, the, where it is, yeah. you know. I couldn't think of an example that was positive but has turned negative. Sure, sure. And I think that that's the idea, right? Is that it doesn't always have to be positive. So in this study, and probably the focus of many games, is to make you feel, like, good. But I suspect it would be possible to foster a sense of place for environments where you're not supposed to feel good. You know, yeah. I, I, I always use the example of, like, when are we going to see the, shake, the, the Schindler's List video game? And that's probably going to be an example where you are not supposed to feel good right now. You're supposed to walk through this and think about it and, and reflect. Has anybody been to the Anne Frank house by chance? I'm just curious. Yeah. That's another one but that the, was... Uh, the Anne Frank VR experience, which, I mean, that's, you're in the same... Right. right! Yeah, yeah. In fact, they have brought that home. And Jeremy, if I'm not mistaken, at one point, don't you go into the attic? Yeah, you can actually go throughout the whole house and like yeah, you know, to go behind the staircase. It's really cool. Yeah, and it's uh, it, and it sort of follows. I feel like the like the bottom floors, people are happy and they're kind of like it's a family. They're having dinner. They're celebrating. And as you go up the house, things get a little more serious and a little more serious. And then finally, when you're in the attic, you realize you like you realize where you're standing, and you're like. This is the attic where this family hid and was found. And, you know, in some ways, uh, Jerry, I think you bring that up. For those of us who have been there physically, it's almost become a spectacle because it's so overly traveled. That there's been a lot of criticism around it becoming like basically a bunch of 11 year olds like writing their names on the walls. You can even make the argument that perhaps the VR experience 
might even be more somber because it gives you all of the elements of the house without like the hawker out front selling t-shirt to say, I was in the attic or what's up doc. Like kind of insensitive, kind of weird, but that culture has permeated. And in fact, Dr. Peasley's research is very much around how do we ethically and personally engage these places? And that could be one. You, you all may have heard about situations where folks go to Auschwitz and play Pokemon Go. And they're trying to balance out like we want the space to be accessible, but you're not forming the sense of place for this place we were hoping. You formed, I caught a Charizard here. What we really wanted you to form was millions and millions of Jews were killed here. And that's why you should revere this place. You know, it's a really interesting point. I'm especially thinking for the library's use of some of these technologies to engage these places. It's not fake. And I think the Anne Frank digital one's a great example of that, where you may even be more authentic. There's another one that's uh, kind of like that as well. I can't think of the name right now, but you uh, ride in a British bomber that is uh, going on a bombing raid. And there was actually a radio uh, DJ that recorded uh, during the whole thing, what he was seeing, what he was encountering. And it plays that back. Oh, wow. The visuals of looking out the plane and seeing, you know, the flak and all that stuff. And so I think that's another big thing that you can do like in the Anne Frank house. You can take away all the ambient sounds of other people talking right. and stuff like that and add in the small details that can be picked up on. And that's an example of where newer production techniques might capitalize on the immersive capabilities of 360 and VR. Things that we didn't really think of as flat producers, but now that we're doing depth production, all of a sudden that becomes like a focal element, right? Um, thank you for that. That was great. And, and thank you for the day. I, I, I got to tell everybody, I'm really appreciating your engagement during these sessions. I think it's really important for us. I think for our colleagues at Zhengda, they're really going to appreciate some of these videos. Um, that's our time for today. Um, so to wrap it all up, we talked about presence and narrative engagement and sense of place. And now these are different ways that we can perceive and engage the, these digital spaces. And I think for today's note, it's that the sky is kind of the limit right now for a lot of this technology. But I hope that you understand that the psychological explanations might help us really make sense of what's going on. And so as you use these technologies, as you demo them for other people, Thinking about some of these concepts might really help you get a sense for how they're experiencing it. Incidentally, if you're interested, send me a note. Maybe I'll put it in the teams. There are scales you can use to measure all this stuff that are really, really simple. Like you could have somebody do an experience and then just give them a, a piece of paper and they can mark some questions. And it would actually tell you if they were feeling like levels of presence, levels of engagement, and levels of sense of place, which can be really neat for some of the demonstrations that we do around campus and around town. Um, we don't meet again for a couple of weeks. I'm pulling up the syllabus real quick to make sure we're on the same page. Um, sorry, I'm sharing my, my screen there. Um, our next session is October 3rd. We're going to focus on natural mapping. We're really going to focus on the controls. And we're going to talk a lot about control schemes, control systems. So maybe between now and then, try to get some experience using all sorts of different types of things from the sort of Damocles all the way up to haptic suits and all the stuff in between. Um, again, for students enrolled in the class, please make sure that you have gotten the email from Zhengda and that you've registered for that account. Um, even do me a favor and send me an email when I know you're registered. Um, what I will do is put together a super quick, I think a couple of folks asked for it, uh, how to actually use some of the systems because they do default to Chinese, but there is a way you can switch it over to English so that it all makes sense. In fact, I'll email my colleagues and see if they can put one together for us. Um, otherwise, don't forget about your questions. That's a lot of points to miss. And otherwise, I think we've been doing really, really good. Okay. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the call and thank everybody for being on board. Have a good one, Professor. Hey, take care, folks. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Bye.